Good. Board together. <coughs> Just, and Pete, would you do the roll call? Sure. Ricker? Uh, here. Smith? Here. Epstein? Here. Thornbrook here. Anne O'Grady? Here. Okay, all present. Uh, next, I'd like to welcome Manager Christensen to the meeting and see if you have any announcements. I do, I do have one announcement, uh, Mr. President. Um, I want to welcome everybody to my first Kirkwood Meadows Public Utility District meeting. Um, it's being live fed over the internet, and the public can view it by going to www.kmpud.com and following the appropriate link. If the public would like to comment or ask a question, <laughs> Please email E. Christison, and that is E. Christ E. Son, don't add an N, at KMPUD.com, and the board will be able to respond. The district asks that the public identify themselves when making comments. Thank you. Okay, and uh, item four comments from the audience. If there's anything that's not on the agenda that anyone would like to bring up from the audience? Okay, having everybody not look at me, I'm going to say the answer is no. <laughs> and next, item five are there any corrections to the agenda or the consent calendar? Two questions on the consent calendar. Okay. Oh, all of it or portions? Well, I just have two questions on the, not the consent, I'm sorry, the consent for claims, I'm sorry. It's the consent for claims portion. Okay, so we'll, we'll pull the consent for claims and make that a separate item, uh, which is uh, B. And then my other recommendation is that we'll move items 9 through 12 and put them in front of uh, 8K, the closed session. Um, are there any other? Um, yeah. Bob, I think we also want to move um, Olga's audit presentation in GASB 68 to uh, the front of finances. Have oh, her go okay. first. All right. Uh, so that's so. So 8A will follow C. Correct. Okay. It's a record for changes. Yes. Um, I have a question on the. Um, Receivables and shutoffs. Uh, okay, so we will um, we'll make that a separate item. Anything else? Uh, okay, so item six would be adoption of the consent calendar, which would be just the regular minutes. So okay, I'll second that. Okay, so it's. Moved by O'Grady and seconded by Pete. Uh, all in favor? All right. Aye. Okay, passes unanimously. All right, so now discussion of eight of six B, uh, consent for claims. Yeah, I questions? just have two questions. One is um, the AT and T broadband for Cam Blue and Green. That's a monthly charge, mm -hmm. and so we're paying twelve thousand plus dollars a year for that. And that's for the T one line. That's for the T1 line mm -hmm. itself. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And then the second question I had has to do with the, uh, some calipers. It, it seems there are two items that are exactly repeated. Um, there's a unfunded liability contribution for three thousand nine forty-eight, mm -hmm. and then so for three dollars nineteen cents, and then they are repeated. That's our. That's our. Um the unfunded liability contribution that we have to make every every month. It's part of when uh, last year when CalPERS uh, redid the percentages that we had to right. pay. So that's the monthly. Uh, oh, I know what it is. Oh, so this is just covering two months. Yeah. Yeah. One's, one's September 13th. Right. One's October. 3rd. Oh, okay, got it. Sorry. Okay, that's what I was wondering. Okay, thank you. That's all. That's okay. Are there any questions. other questions on consent for claims? So is there a motion to approve? Yes, sir. Okay, so moved by Stanish, approved by Eric. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, passes unanimously. All right, item 6C, uh, receivables and shutoff reports. So questions? So the question I have involves the UEs, and uh, they were lot 33, they were the, the lot that exploded. And I'm just wondering what the district, how the district went back and informed the, the customer that the board had decided not to provide any relief because it looks like they've gone into the you know, danger zone, so to speak. Um, I personally did not let them know. I don't know if Michael let them know or not. Um, I assumed that. I heard Michael talking to him. 
Yeah. I know that Michael did let them know. Uh, any other questions on receivables? Now, is there a motion to approve it? So move. Okay, Eric moves. Second. second. Standard seconds. All right, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, <coughs> aye. aye, approved. Okay, so that takes care of the consents. So we're now ready for item eight, and we'll start with the audit. So we'd like to welcome Olga to. Uh, and Kelly, are you going to start? I'm or how? going to put her presentation up. Okay. Where is it's it? the very top one in that window. It's the very... Oh, gotcha. <coughs> I'll let you sit here. Yeah. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm Olga Darlington. I'm a partner on the engagement, on the audit engagement. And I will walk you through the results of our audit. We completed our audit work um, in August. Um, at this point, we are planning on issuing unmodified opinion on the financial statements of the district. Um, the financial statements include the individual fund, fund um, presentation of the governmental funds proprietary funds and the fiduciary fund. In addition to our audit opinion, we will issue um, two reports. One is the communication letter on internal controls that provides some suggestions to the internal control structure uh, improvements for management's consideration. And um, the second letter is our U.S. management letter, which is a required document that our U.S. Uh, requests us to provide based on the, on the results of our audit. There's certain procedures that they ask us to do. Um, and in that letter, we provide them with some assurances um, on those procedures specifically. Just wanted to highlight some of the areas um, of uh, specific emphasis during our audit. Uh, for every utility we audit, we spend quite a bit of time looking at internal controls just because the internal control structure is so important for the financial reporting in the utility. Um, the billings, for example, the number of customers, the rates, just making sure that, that everything gets billed correctly for all the usage to the customers, um, as well as collected. We do look at controls surrounding the construction projects and all of the costs that get added to that and how those um, projects get closed and capitalized. Based on our work on those internal controls, we did come up with um, a few suggestions uh, that we included in the letter uh, to management for the consideration. None of them are considered significant deficiencies or material weaknesses, which is um, a very good uh, point. Um, it means the internal controls are working, there's some mitigating controls in place, um, and there is no severe weaknesses in the internal controls that could potentially result in misrepresentation mis uh, in the financial statements. One of the big areas that we spend quite a bit of time in is uh, management's estimates. Those are the balances that cannot necessarily be confirmed or tested through supporting detail from third parties. Um, they include um, assumptions that are made by management based on their knowledge of business, the historic performance, and, and um, things of that nature. So some of those balances are um, net pension liability is a big one, um, some accrual balances um, and allowances. Um, for revenue testing, we test um, uh, power purchase expense through confirmation with the third parties because there's a one big contract uh, for power purchase as well as fuel purchase for diesel. Um, but expense or revenues we test um, analytically just because um, we try to break it down by <coughs> category of customers and um, apply certain rates and historic trends to uh, the balance sets. Capital plant, as I mentioned, there is a lot of activity generally that goes in every utility in the capital plant um, area. Um, this past year, the district didn't have as many projects as it did in the last couple of years with completion at, with, of Outlet Valley project. So we selected just a couple of projects and really traced all of the costs that were accumulated into the um, project and uh, approval of those costs. 
debt balances, having significant um, debt from our U.S. and some COP debt. We look at those balances in great detail. We confirm those balances with third parties to make sure that they're properly stated in the financial statements. And um, the other area that we test thoroughly is compliance with covenants or whatever debt agreement requirements are to make sure that the district is in compliance. And then net position, we generally look at the classification of uh, what's reported in the capital investments, restricted or unrestricted, and we'll particularly pay attention to the restricted category to make sure that any outside or third-party restrictions are properly reflected. Um, one of the biggest questions I do still get from um, many of my clients is the pension items, is what, what is it, how, how is it determined, um, just because it's such a complicated balance. And it's not only one balance on the financial statements, there's several of them that are sprinkled around. And um, there is so much information that goes into determination of those balances that um, questions continue to come up. Um, I wanted to provide this slide to summarize uh, the individual balance um, balances that are included in the financial statements um, on the balance sheet and the income statement. Um, and I also wanted to provide kind of a comparative for the last three years since the standard was implemented as to how those balances have changed from year to year. Um, and hopefully that will visually provide a little bit of an explanation of volatility of the balance, particularly the, pen the pension expense. So the pension liability is the first one. Uh, it's a liability that's reflected in the uh, financial statements. That one is pretty much straightforward. You know, we take the total um, pension liability at the CalPERS at a state level, um, subtracting from that any fiduciary net position or assets that are invested by the plan. And that net pension liability is um, taken um, by the percentage of participation by the district. So it's pretty straightforward, just proportionate share of the net pension liability. Um, I believe you that's straightforward, but I still want to know. So that number, is that the expected <coughs> amount of pay, the shortcoming, the expected amount of payoff for who's ever currently retired right. on the average expected lifetime? Yes. So the total pension liability, the plan determines it based on the actuarial assumptions and the census data. Census data comes from the participants in the plan. So this is your, you know, male, female participants, their ages, their um, um, status, and so forth. So that um, number of years of service that they have in the, um, in the system. So this includes people that haven't retired yet? Yes. Right. Yes. And the assumption is that everyone works here until retirement? There's a certain assumption of um, expected <coughs> retirement age, yes. Okay. Um, and, and those are the assumptions that are uh, part of the actuarial assumptions. So um, how long they will live, when they will, will decide to retire, um, those types of things. Okay, and we have a s relatively small sample base, so I assume that's on average across? It is across. It's a cost-sharing plan, So, which means that all of the participants in the plan, the thousands of districts and, and cities and counties um, that participate in CalPERS, it averages everyone. Okay. It's, it's not specific to the district. And so is the calculation based on their results as of June 2016? Yes, and that is a very important um, consideration. So the CalPERS provides information um, to uh, its participants, which is a year behind. Um, so the 2017 balance is calculated based on information from June 2016, which is actually based on census information from 2015. So there's a process of gathering that information, analyzing, and performing the um, actuarial evaluation. So it is lagging a couple of years behind okay. as well. And okay. as you said, this is the simple one. This is a simple one, yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so as I mentioned, the total pension liability has some assumptions in it. The uh, fiduciary net position, so as investments are invested, um, there's a certain assumption of um, what those earnings will be over the time. Um, you know, by the t long term investment rate, essentially. Is this a present value? The liability is discounted um, back to present value using the discount rate, yes. Now, I would, I'll phrase it as a question. Um, is, the made, is the high level driver CalPERS's 
investment portfolio. So if it goes up, the liability should go down, but our liability is going up the last couple of years. Well, because the existing existing employees keep earning benefits, so it's not just the retired employees. Your existing workforce is is entitled to those benefits, so they're getting earned. So that's the growing part of the liability, and I think that's the biggest one because as new participants enter the plan, they become eligible, and as people age and retire, they're still eligible for the benefits. So that's the reason that but that the wouldn't explain that. Interesting is it seems like that would be embedded in all the assumptions. I mean, so in other words, they should. You would think that they'd be assuming that people grow older and they keep contributing, and and so that'd be one of the assumptions in the calculation that goes out 30 years or 40 years or however long it goes. Right. It does, but it gets updated annually based on changes in the plans. So new participants coming in, participants retiring, any changes. I guess the thing that maybe that we're trying to say is having it double in one year is probably not a result of a change in our employment pool. No, not at all. Yeah, so no. that gets to Stanish's question. I mean, coppers used to assume 7 and a half or 8%. They're bringing it, bring it down. They and did they must be bringing it down, and that they must be did. a large factor. They did. And you know, the, the discount rate is actually one the single most... Um, that's more volatile the right yeah, uh, factor that causes that liability. There is a, we actually there's a requirement in the footnotes to include that um, sensitivity t uh, analysis of the uh, discount rate, and you'll see it in the footnote. Just changing it one percent from seven and a quarter to eight and a quarter and a six and a quarter, how significantly it changes the liability just for this district? It sure. almost doubles it. So, um, so that's the big component. Okay. All right. Sounds All right. like we got line one nailed then. <laughs> so that's that's it. Okay. So <laughs> yeah, I really I was nailed. <laughs> <laughs> just bracketed. Bracketed. So okay. let me let me talk about the resource deferred inflow resources and outflow resources. First of all. Um, these balances are unique to governmental entities, that you will not see deferred outflow resources and in, 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 in inflow resources in a, in a commercial entity's financial statements or FASB reporters. And um, what these balances are, are essentially at deferrals, uh, placeholder items that are parked on the balance sheet. Um, outflow is a debit and inflow is a credit. Um, to account for um, change in assumptions. In this case, it's all related to pension item. So what happens is, on an annual basis, certain um, components of the calculation flow through the pension expense, and that's actual contributions made to PERS. Those flow through the, uh, through the expense on the delay, but they do. Um, but items, for example, like the volatility in investment or assumptions, those actuarial assumptions um, for calculation of the liability, um, changes in a discount rate, um, assumptions for the investment earnings, all of those are, um, because they change from year to year and could change significantly, and don't have significant or they don't have immediate impact on current year expense. They get parked on the balance sheet in the resources um, items, and as assumptions change from year to year, um, that balance um, fluctuates um, and gets recorded on the balance sheet, and it, it, it gets amortized over a set period. There's components to the deferred inflows and outflows that get amortized over certain periods, three to five um, in this case, and that amortization flows to the expense as well. Um, the and we're just told what those are. We have no control over it. Exactly, no. yes. Um, well, yeah, none of it you can really impact, um, unfortunately. Um, the footnotes to the financial statements break down the balances of the deferred inflows and outflows to explain what those assumptions are that are included in those balances. Okay. Um, but um, otherwise, um, they're really just kind of sitting there and W w the intention is to um, soften the impact to the P&L because if these balances didn't exist, there's going to be there would have been more um, impact to the pension um, expense. So that that was the intent of Gasby when they created those balances. And like I say, because um, there's several components to that calculation, those balances will fluctuate could fluctuate significantly from year to year. As you see, deferred outflows, uh, for example, compared to current year to prior change. Okay. 
And then the final one is the pension expense, which is unfortunately entirely unpredictable uh, because it takes um, into uh, consideration all of the impact of the balance sheet accounts um, as well as the actual contributions made um, to the plan. And as you see, it, it kind of flips back and forth between being a credit and a debit. And um, part of it is cash uh, component, but a lot of it is amortization from the deferred accounts and um, calculation change uh, from the pension liability. So if I added up the changes in these three balance sheet items, would I get the 364? Um, close. That's we do we do reconciliation of that balance, and I can provide it to you, no, um, no. but in, in great excruciating detail. <laughs> Kel, Kelly knows all about it, um, but it, it it is essentially a fallout of all of the other. Okay. Yes. Close. So the lesson learned is really it's it, it's frustrating to many of our clients and the boards is that it's it's almost impossible to predict the impact on the P&L of the pe pension expense <coughs> and the um, change in the liability. It really is all handled at the, even the discount rate, any of the assumptions are handled at the plan level at CalPERS. Um, so the good news is um, CalPERS does provide the information um, earlier now because the reporting for 63017 is a year behind. They do provide it earlier. In right. a, um, this year was Q1 of um, 17. So by the time the year is done, we're able to calculate that impact and include it. Um, so I, and I wouldn't even care about this stuff except for its impact on the 1.05, the tier ratio. And that's, you know, so that we have to include it in our rate structure. Otherwise, I'd say, well, okay, it's just, just numbers on paper. <coughs> it doesn't really mean anything except for that 1.05. Um. Well, let me test that assumption for a second. Yeah. Could you also say the pension liability is the unfunded liability? It is. <coughs> okay, so that's a future risk that well, we would we would have to deal with, and well, yeah. yeah, okay. I mean, that was the intent of right. the GASB when they issued this standard: is to make the future liabilities really visible. Uh, the way the accounting was done before, it was really not clear what the total liability for the pension for future benefits that your employees working right now are entitled to, and that's what was the intent. So it is a future liability that will have to be funded for. Yeah, but I don't, I don't, do we really know that this is the liability for our employees? I mean, I know it's all calculated and so on, but mm -hmm, mm -hmm. anyway, it's just the, the, the big thorn is the 1.05. We've got to take most of this, well, when it's particularly when it's an expense, mm -hmm. we've got to take most of it and attribute it to electricity, mm -hmm. and then we've got to include that in our rates. Okay. So, so this I'll, year it's a credit. This year's a credit, yeah. So all that is true, but let me just test. So let's say it's 30 years from now, someone else is having this conversation. We've paid off the debt, but we have 14 employees that are retired, mm -hmm. and we have a large unfunded liability. I mean, we're going to have to contribute more to that and raise rates to cover it, right, at some point. Yes and no. Um, uh, I'll, I'll accept no as the answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the reason is this is really um, an accounting calculation of future liability. It's not necessarily directly tied to the funding piece. So CalPERS has their calculation for the funding piece of uh -huh. the net pension liability on which they base their rates of contributions for everyone. So this really, um, I can't say it was 100% certainty that this is a liability we'll be paying out 30 years from now. It will change over time, and the funding will change. Um, but that's okay. one of those things where CalPERS has... Um, you now are paying that unfunded liability. There's other components in their assumptions of what the funding um, should be. Okay. Uh, that's so not necessarily reflected in the accounting. All right. So this is our chance to try to understand this. Well, so uh, oh, I, I okay, guess this is the key. So the pension liability, it's... It's a liability I mean, that look, comes look, due. If I've got a mortgage on my house, and I would say I owe a million dollars on the house, and I don't have a million dollars... In a sense, that's an unfunded liability, right? Right. right. doesn't right. mean I won't be able to cover it. Right. 
And same thing here, right? I mean, it's it not like it's saying, oh, you're in trouble, get $800,000 in your account right away. It well, is. But it is saying if everything else stayed static, that you, there will be a future shortfall. Because we, we contribute a certain amount, and there's a certain amount going out. Exactly. And if you run that movie forward, they're predicting that over time we'll have to pay more. Okay, so is this unfunded in the sense that it, there's an inadequate amount being contributed each year? Or is it unfunded no, in the sense just, in that it's in the future and you're going to have to keep contributing? It just says at this point of time, there is a larger liability than there's assets invested. Assuming everything else stays constant. Exactly. Yeah, it no, does not. Well, it does. It's not. It's not a funding mechanism. It's an accounting right, yeah. calculation. It doesn't come due. Yeah. Right. I mean, and the th thing is, just like the mortgage example. I mean, I will keep paying off that mortgage every month. Well, even the though I don't have analogy, the mortgage analogy, Calpers is the is in your situation. It's, it's they have they owe more than they have in the bank. Well. Well. Yeah. But that mean but more money is going to be coming in all the time. Anyway, not, I don't not unless they change the deferral rate so, or the contribution rate. So let me ask a related question. So, in a year where the contribution, uh, the, the Calpers total payout exceeds their earnings on assets and contributions, did they just reduce their total assets to pay it? Well, they reduce the assets any time they pay anything out. Yes, because that co comes out of the invested assets. Okay. At what point do they raise the chart, the amount we have to pay in? How do they determine the difference between whether they just have less assets or whether they demand more payment? Well, they do look at, um, they have a whole committee that talks about the funding and how they already. should be, as well as the investment committee, okay. yes. Um, the thing I, I recommend that you think about it separately of what funding is versus what the accounting balance yeah, is I, because I okay. this balance is impacted let's take discount rate like i said just the slightest change in that discount rate will change that liability right. so there's so many unlike your mortgage ex uh, example in a mortgage you kind of know here's your rate here's it's all unless it's variable rate you know what you're going to be paying out for the next 30 years here there's too many assumptions that could change over the next 30 years that could either raise this balance or decrease it. Um, it's it's a, like I say, it's a calculation at a point in time right yeah. now that, um, based on some of these other assumptions, will likely change. Okay, there was a question. Yes, uh, two questions. So, so um, if, the, if the PUD had w went out of business on June 30th, 2017, would it have to have the, the 832 in cash? Um, No. No. This is a long-term liability that we'll be paying out. Well, I no. <laughs> but there would be some what, claim. The, the reason I, I'm, I'm trying to make it not as complicated, um, if the district was out of business, it would have to exit the plan, and then um, somebody would have to pick up the liability for the employees that are retired or have um, in, are entitled to benefits. So... Um, no, this is not a okay. typo. Yeah. All right, so my question is, at what point does that number become something that we should take action on, or are we just observers for until you tell us we're not? Take action on from a standpoint of uh, the raid design? Well, accruing extra money to cover retirement. Or do we just be told, be told what to do? I mean, is there any... I, I'm thinking to the example of the cities that have gone bankrupt mm -hmm. over this issue. What did they miss, and what should they have done sooner? And when do we fall into the category where the board needs to take some action and not just observe the numbers fluctuating? Well, you you can set up a um, a designated fund internally to start funding it, but it really you won't be able to impact that number because once again it comes through an actuarial calculation. So what you as a district will be um, required to do is pay what um, funding rates PERS has calculated, CalPERS, um, for you to provide into the plan. Okay. Um, and uh, you know those could come 
increase over time that um, the district would have to pay. Um, okay. But outside of that, you can't really fund it by itself, okay. by yourself. So, so since district. we've looked into the costs of exiting CalPERS and switching them anything else, and that's prohibitive. So we've eliminated that. So our position is we observe this, and at some point we'll get a larger bill, and we'll figure out how to pay it. There's no, Pretty much that's where we are. Right. You kind of have to wait on what CalPERS t tells you as your funding requirement is and just fund that. Um, okay. Funding more, this is not like a, um, like a 401k plan where you have your set um, right. trust balance. It really just goes in the general pool. So the more you contribute, it goes in the general pool okay. um, in being invested as, as part of the entire plan assets, right. not the district. So the assets. California cities that had to declare bankruptcy over this issue, they got a notice of a higher rate and they just didn't have the money to cover it? They couldn't it. pay. Okay. Who determines those rates? Did you say it was the investment board or is there? The, um, the actuaries um, and the discount rate is the investment board, yes. Uh, go ahead. So the um, district paid off the side fund. I still don't understand what the side fund is, but anyway. So did that pay it off? We, we made paid. a payment oh, towards we it. it we'll go, we pay will it. pay it off we, in two payments. We've okay. done one. So is that, I would think that's a positive, but how does that impact what we're looking at up here? It's separate. That was our own special little thing that we that we borrowed against them and now we're paying it. So we took out an extra loan. It will get reflected in our calculations for, you know, this up this next year, um, you, this the side fund exactly. payment that I exactly. get. So that it's definitely part of the calculation, you know, when we when we make those payments. Like the our our yeah. unfunded liability payment went down the monthly payment that we have to make because we paid that fifty five thousand dollars. So it's it is part. It of does the get incorporated into it, um, into the calculation. But okay. once again, it's not specific to that liability. Okay, so you're telling us that everything we can possibly do, we're doing, and there isn't more that <laughs> Just watch we should it do. Carefully. <laughs> yes. Okay. All right. Okay. Moving on. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Moving All right. On. Thank you. Um, some of the required communications that I have to provide to you based on um, the auditing standards that we follow is that this um, wonderful set of financial statements is a, a responsibility of management. Management um, takes full responsibility for all the numbers. We as auditors just audit everything and make sure the disclosures are accurate and numbers are supported. Um, the audit was performed according to scope. We didn't have any um, surprises during the audit. Um, nothing out, out of the ordinary that we just had to scramble to do. Um, I think we um, did very well. Um, I think hel it, it helps a lot to communicate with management throughout the year and um, Kelly letting us know what's going on and working through some of those complex pension calculations early on. So that was, that was time savings. Significant accounting policies included in footnote one. Um, there were not a lot of changes to those policies. Um, mainly because there are no um, big significant GASB statements that impacted the district that required the policy changes this year. Um, we are asking for certain representations from management that uh, letter will be signed um, and provided to us before we issue the financial statements. Um, there are no unrecorded adjustments in the financial sta statements that were identified during the year that management chose not to post. There's, um, there's none of those. Um, whatever was identified during the audit um, by either us or management got corrected in the statement. So everything got incorporated. We did not have any disagreements. Um, as far as we know, management doesn't consult with any other um, auditors, um, commonly known as opinion shopping. <laughs> um, well, that's a little dry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> as far as we know, they're not shopping for any other opinions. No. Um, we do not perform fraud procedures um, to identify fraud, but we do uh, perform some procedures that if there were indicators of fraud uh, and if we identified anything, we would report those to you. Um, but we did not identify any illegal acts or inappropriate um, activities that needed to be reported to you. And we are independent with respect to the district as the independent auditors. Right. Um, 
and this is uh, this is the main um, the main communication that I want to leave you with is that um, it's it's really a great pleasure working with management here. Everybody's been very very helpful and very um, prepared for us, very responsive to our numerous questions. And um, audits are not easy, and we are not easy auditors, I have to say. So we ask a lot of questions, and we dig a lot of. Uh, into all of the transactions and, and reports. Um, but tone at the top from management was that of just being very open, very responsive, very um, helpful, and uh, we very much appreciate their help. Congratulations. That's good on Hey, Olga, I have one question back on your pension liability table here, which is um, pension expense over the three years is actually a credit of 100 69,000 if you add them up, but the liability has more than doubled. Is the difference reflected in those two middle categories, the deferred inflow and the deferred outflow? It is, because remember, mm -hmm. uh, the um, pension expense uh, does not reflect some of those other assumptions that get parked on the balance sheet just to... Well, the intent was to smooth the impact on the ex pension expense from some of those assumptions that will be changing over time, uh, like actuarial assumptions and discount rate assumptions. So yes, the change is in the um, deferred, if you will, on the balance sheet until fully known. Thank you. Yes? I don't know whether you have that for a slide or not regarding the, I think that's the internal control letter. letter. Mm -hmm. So number one has to do with utility rates, but there's a reference in there for July of 2018. Why? That's not this. We're in 27. This is 2017, 2018. Why is there something in there about another a fiscal upcoming fiscal year? Well, the uh, the nice thing about being an auditor is that we come after year end, and whatever we um, find throughout the period um, of our audit before we issue the report, we we identified and report that. And it was just one of those items that we identified while we were still in the field. And it was more timely to report to you now than wait till next year's report. And as a matter of fact, that item was kind of brought up to us by management because um, it was identified. We identified it in walking through internal controls. And um, the point was that the internal um, processes have caught that error. Um, it just our recommendation was that um, review should have been happening up front before the error occurred to find it. But the process is in place uh, for this particular item for management to have caught it before um, before we identified it in the following year audit. That's how it came up. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? Right. Okay. Thank you very much Thanks for your attention and pa pa patience with the pension items. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for tolerating Thank you. our questions. <laughs> okay, then let's go to 8A and get an update on the financials. So um, the June and July uh, financials that were in your packet were just for representment. Um, so I'm going to start with um, the August uh, balance sheet, and that's on page 58 of your packet. Um, I noted that uh, in total capital reserve, we uh, have more than budget, and this is basically due to timing of uh, completion of capital projects. Um, we had budgeted for more um, more capital projects to be completed uh, through August, and just we haven't got there yet. So we've got more um, in capital reserve than uh, budgeted for. And the other note I wanted to uh, make on the uh, balance sheet was the 
uh, difference in total accumulated depreciation and unamortized debt expenses. That's uh, basically due to a reclassification that came through with the completion of the continuing property records. So you can see they basically net out. So it's just basically a, a reclassification that came through when um, continuing property records were completed. Um, and then also just to note, uh, total accounts payable is uh, down from plan, and that's just uh, due to timing and payments of uh, expenses. And that's all I have on the balance sheet, unless there are any questions. Any questions? No? Okay. Uh, on to the combined income statement on page 60. Um, you'll note that there is a... Uh, base rates are down from plan, and this is due to a uh, calculation error in the budget for the number of EDUs, um, uh, mainly in water and wastewater. There was, uh, I'll go, go into the details when we get to the water fund, but uh, there was uh, a definite miscalculation in the number of EDUs for residential uh, uh, customers in water and wastewater. Um, Total operating revenues, though, are up from plan by $35,000. Um, <clears throat> Year-to-date, total operating uh, is up from plan by $153,000. So a good start to, uh, to the year through August for the first couple of months of the season. Um, we should probably mention that the $6,000 per month debt on the base rate adjustment will be an ongoing monthly debt of about 6000 due to the miscalculation. In the, and that's uh, noted in the known budget variances now. <clears throat> so. Yeah. Um, moving on. compared to previous year? Is the base, the total base rate for water and wastewater is <coughs> less than last year, the monthly amount, or is it the same? The The total actual revenue, is it approximately the same as previous years, or is it less? Uh, it's it seems to be close to the same. That's yeah. what I thought. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. but the the budget the budget it's a budget miscalculation as opposed to a revenue short. Exactly. Okay. Uh, moving on to the general fund, um, you'll notice that there is an overage in payroll uh, salaries and benefits, um, but you you see this savings in other departments. It's just a matter of where hours were posted. Um, and where I budgeted those hours to be posted. So um, in reality, we, we actually have uh, a savings in salaries and benefits of about $6,000. Um, but in G&A, it's over budget. Um, also, you'll notice uh, contract services. Uh, there's a uh, what looks to be a savings there of about $35,000, but that's just due to the timing of receiving the last invoice from the audit. So we have received that invoice and that will be reflected in uh, September's um, statements. Uh, moving on to fire department, um, year to date total operating is up from plan by $8,400 and this is directly related to the per good performance at the summer festival. And we'll also see um, in September the uh, chili cook-off and the, um, the 5K, 10K as well. <clears throat> Move on to the water fund on uh, page 65. So you can see um, the base rates there. Uh, in the budget, there was uh, the residential EDUs were calculated at 724. Um, we actually have 631 residential customers, and I believe that the 724 number came from when we were originally going to change the residential EDU to be based on usage. We decided against that and decided to put it all towards just the water usage rather than their base rates as well, um, and I don't think that number ever got changed back. So that's where the, the error stems from. Um, Year-to-date, though, total operating in water is up from plan by $12,000, um, and that's due to a savings and expenses. So even with the, you know, the budget shortfall in 
uh, base rates, we're still making up for it in savings and expenses for water. So hopefully we can continue that. Um, moving on to wastewater. Um, wastewater doesn't have quite the impact uh, of base rate um, miscalculation only because the commercial base rates um, for uh, wastewater in the budget, we're actually making more in commercial base rate revenue than, uh, than we had budgeted for. So the impact is only about $1,500 a month in base rates for wastewater. Um, but still, they do have an impact from that. Um, wastewater total operating uh, for the year is up from plan by about seventeen or eighteen thousand um, dollars. This will be going away. We have a very large expense coming for centrifuge repair of about twenty five thousand dollars that was not budgeted for. So um, the thorn in our side will always be wastewater, apparently. <laughs> yes. Um, moving on to electric on page sixty eight. Uh, Year-to-date total revenues for electric are up from plan by $36,000. Um, and year-to-date total operating is uh, up by $88,000. So uh, another good start to electric. Um, uh, and hopefully we can keep that up and no lines will go down this year. And hopefully our winter is not as crazy as last year. Uh, moving on to propane on page 71. Uh, total operating revenues are down from plan by $5,700, but we see that savings in cost of goods sold, um, and that's just basically due to the cost of propane. Um, so even though we are down in revenue, we're also saving in expenses, so it kind of uh, it nets out. Uh, so total operating for uh, propane for the year is just slightly under budget by a thousand dollars so a good start for propane and that is all I have on income statements is there any questions any questions for Kelly propane breaks even on an annual basis right yes yeah that we never have to allocate any yeah. property tax revenue to them they they pay it pays for itself yeah. um, August EBITDA uh, we were better than planned by uh, forty seven thousand uh, dollars for August and year to date we are up uh, one hundred and forty four thousand dollars so uh, again we're starting the year right Um, we'll move on to uh, the September preliminary income statement. Um, revenues are actuals, uh, so we per, we have uh, better than planned by $25,000 for September, bringing us year to date um, better than planned by $60,000. Um, so even with that, uh, the error in base rates, we're still um, still in a good spot for September. Um, and as you know, uh, September expenses are just an estimate at this point. It's not, uh, those are not actuals by any means. Um, so on that topic, um, Bob asked a question yesterday, and it's relevant if we accelerate committee meetings, as we discussed in the Finance Committee meeting. How quickly could you close the books? Meaning, we're here uh, October 14th, and um, is the delay in closing the books left over from cash accounting, or why can't we close them in a couple of days? Uh, because we haven't received all of our invoices that, you know, that are coming in. Um, it takes time to do all the journal entries necessary to actually get the books closed. Um, I can usually get the books closed by the 20th of the following month. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a fair amount of time for us to get everything put together and get all the uh, invoices entered, get all the journal entries done that have to be done. So um, it's, it just it takes time to reconcile all that stuff. So, um, but Just to pursue, I mean, every for-profit business I've been in, we've generally closed on the second day of the month. 
And um, if there's a significant expense, let's say, for example, the audit one, you, you know what is going to arrive, then you just accrue for it. So that would be an option for closing early would be to accrue for things you know are likely to come in and then everything else just flows in the next month. I mean, is that more labor than De Wade? Well, it, it's definitely, it would be a big change in the way that we do. I, I totally recognize yeah, that. Yeah. yeah, that's, that's, I mean, that's the, the labor part of it is not, you know, doing a journal entry to accrue something is not, you know. Right. Intensive. It would just be the the way that we um, the way that we do POs would have to be you know we'd have to change the way that that happens. So I mean it's definitely possible, mm -hmm. but okay. Nancy had a question. Yeah. I'm just curious whether or not your city vendors now use um, you know give you invoices via email. I mean obviously we're oh yeah we have yeah. lots of yeah vendors that provide us. So, I mean, is there any way to push more to that, to that effort, scan and send? And I've never been in a business to encourage people to bill us quicker. <laughs> <laughs> well, if that's what you're to proposing. Get to that. Get to that. How to, how to, uh, We'd rather have them take six season. months, right? Yeah. Yeah. From yeah. a cash point. From a cash point, yes. But yeah. I, when I get invoices that are six months old, it it's messes not things up. nice. Yeah. yeah. Especially if it's after June 3rd. Right. Uh, okay. Um, moving on to uh, September uh, metered versus budget. Uh, we metered uh, 314,000 kilowatt hours. We budgeted for 310,000 kilowatt hours, and that's a variance, positive variance of 44, 4,500 uh, kilowatt hours. And as compared to last September, um, it was better by 7,400 kilowatt hours. And I believe that to be totally uh, related to the fact that September was cold. We had a cold September. Mm -hmm. at, at least I felt like it was cold. I turned my heat on a lot sooner this year than I did last year. Um, and propane, uh, we uh, metered 645,000 cubic feet. We budgeted for 422,000 cubic feet, so a difference of 223,000 cubic feet. Um, last year we metered 453,000 cubic feet, so uh, we metered 192,000 more cubic feet this year than last year. Again, I think that's directly related to the temperature. Okay. Um, if we actually did want to try to figure this out, I mean, we, we do know how many residential days people mm -hmm. were in their places over every year, and we also know the average temperature for every single day, so if and everyone... Yeah. Uh, people have their heat set at a, you know, a certain thing. So even if they're not here, their heat right. comes on too. So. Uh, uh, right. But so we could actually, if we wanted to, try to model this, just for fun. <laughs> just for fun, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Standish volunteered. I <laughs> Um, Do you have electric heat? Is that what you're saying? No, I have I have propane. Yeah, but yeah. Some, there's a few electric heat, mm -hmm. and also the if it's propane with a boiler, then there's pumps <laughs> operating. Yeah. And the fans that the blow fans. the yeah yeah so um, historical September for kilowatt hours metered, um, our highest was in 2015 at 320,000 kilowatt hours. Um, we weren't far behind that this year at 314. Um, I also would like to mention that in 2015, we probably were not quite as uh, accurate. accurate in our metering. So that could be uh, the other. We, had a, we gave right. people a lot of money back when we found out that uh, meters were incorrect. So, um, but still a yeah, good, good start for the year. And moving on to cash waterfall, um, we had uh, 1.6 million in um, in operating cash and 895,000 in our cushion of credit, bringing our total operating to 2.5 million. We had budgeted for 2.1 million, and so a difference of $323,000 uh, in cash. Um, 
and we're still looking at uh, December to be our low point this year as per usual December is usually when our cash low point is but uh, even still better than budget the whole way through and in the in the audit numbers I'm trying to remember is the cushion of credit just subtracted from the debt mm-hmm Okay. It's, so it's the assumption is that that would pay off debt if we were right. closing things off. It's restricted to debt yeah. funding. It cannot be spent on right, right. Mm-hmm. So, yes. Okay. And Russ requires us to post it as a advanced unapplied payment is what they call it. Okay. Makes sense. Um, and so, uh, so far known budget variances for the year uh, is that base rate EDU calculation error. Um, and the total uh, annual impact is $72,000, about $72,000. We've already made that up, though, even uh, just about with the $60,000 in uh, revenue overage uh, as compared to budget. So um, that number looks pretty big, but, you know, I feel like we've already netted that out at this point. And the GM recruitment consulting, and as previously stated, that was probably a good... (laughs) <laughs> a good money well, spent. money well spent. Yes, those are the the words. Um, uh, and the extra work that we're doing on wastewater and that—that's you expect that all to sort of fit within the budget? No, no. So that's no, a are, that's a likely other variable. Oh, it's that yeah. Spend. That yeah. will be on there next month. Oh, okay. <laughs> and we budgeted some, some. Well, I think there was some from last year that we used this year. Is that right? We're, there was some yeah. for the collection system. system. Yeah, collection. yeah this, this is the centrifuge for oh, yeah. Yeah. There's, yeah. yeah, there's two issues Unexpected that are coming up things. under wastewater we'll discuss in okay. a little bit. It's the centrifuge and the absorption bed pumps. Those okay. are the two we'll discuss. Those will be the variances. Okay. Uh, yes, question. So is there, is there any benefit to trying to identify or to keep a running record of what the – we do great on the expenses. What about on the revenue side? Is there any benefit to that as we get towards budgeting for the next year? I mean, in my recollection is, is we're now three years into better than budget. But that's because we budget for a drought? We, uh, we use an average, you know, yeah. a, a five-year so, average. So there's a five-year average, so we've got three years of drought in there. Mm-hmm. So if the weather doesn't cooperate the way we'd like it to, we can manage the year. And I personally would err on the side of caution. You know, yeah. I, I would, I, I would like to be more conservative. You know, even though the last two years we've performed better, you know, I feel like that it's better to be cautious with the, yeah. the weather. But that's, so that's why that's happening. And and quite frankly, there's significant deferred maintenance costs that will be starting to hit the district and. This conservative budgeting, budgeting is going to pay off when those start hitting. Our infrastructure is very old. Okay. Uh, That's it. The Thank you very much. Mm-hmm. With the Except the power plant, brand new. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Let's um, move on to AD then. Uh, the chili cook Stay with me. You know, okay. Wrap up. <laughs> and. Although we, we appreciate all the work that your firm has done, and thank you for coming today. Yes, Saturday. thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay, Rick. Good morning. Good morning. So, yeah, as you know, on September 2nd, um, we had the chili cook-off. This is our first time hosting the event, and um, I think the comments from Cheryl Stern, who did an outstanding job helping us prepare for the event, um, uh, anticipate the needs and, and making sure that we were on track. I can't thank her enough for all her hard work. So thank, thank you, Cheryl. Very much. And she said it nicely in an email to me um, recently, and she said she indicated that people found the event fun and well organized and huge improvements over recent years. And so I think that was notable. Um, as I presented at the last board meeting, uh, overall, we we learned a lot about this event. We, we, we are experts at special event fundraising activities with the summer festival, of course. But um, today I'm going to present essentially the numbers. For revenue and donations and um, 
a few of the award participants who actually gave back their their award uh, prize money uh, for having best chili and so forth. Uh, the total revenue was five thousand four hundred forty dollars. Um, I'm sorry, I'm looking at ten k. Sorry that. Um, this is a little bit better. So for registration and donations, the total revenue was $15,529. For expenses, we came in at $9,786 for a net barbecue revenue of $5,742. Um, and so the one thing that's not accounted for, of course, as you know, is labor. But um, again, I think overall we learned a lot for this event, and everybody had a great time. And so. Um, uh, luckily, we had fantastic weather that weekend. We didn't have smoke. We didn't have rain. Um, of course, if those things came into play, it would significantly change the the overall event, as you can imagine. So, the second thing that happened that weekend, unless there's any questions about the chili cookoff, was the I, I believe there is one. Oh, sorry, Nancy. This is really a question for Cheryl. As you looked at the, the recap, are there any expenses there that surprised you, or are they kind of in line, or, um, or was it the revenue, or? <clears throat> I'm going to defer on that because I have questions out to both Rick and Kelly at this point uh, that I'm still waiting for resolution on. So, uh, okay. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. Second event for that day was the Kirkwood 10K and a 5K 10K, and it was actually a half mile kids fun run um, that we advertised a one mile kids fun run. So that was an error on our part. This was the first year, or this was the 37th annual event, and the first year that we used Ultra Sign Up for registration process. In years past, we've used uh, Tahoe Mountain Milers as the uh, coordinator for the event, and then I was a co uh, race director along with others. Uh, but we brought back um, a key person from Tahoe Mountain Miler days, and that was Ken Castrico. And uh, he helped us work with Ultra Sign Up for registration process, and it went really smoothly. However, we, we learned a lot. Um, day of event registration, there were a few lines, and I think next <coughs> year we'll change things so we can eliminate the lines and have a smoother start at the beginning of the race. Overall, for revenue, we received $5,440. And for expenses, the biggest expense being T-shirts, um, which was at $1,400. The overall expenses were at $1,620. But the net revenue for the event was actually $3,819. And in years past, we've received checks from Tile Mountain Miners for $2,000, $1,800. So this was the first year that we saw a huge increase in our overall net revenue for the event um, with, I think, a little or no extra work for district staff and I want to thank Jessica Austin who's here taking notes for the board um, for her work behind the scenes along with uh, Chief Trevette who was uh, also very helpful with this year's event. Uh, so that brings the total for the September 2nd uh, fundraising events to around $9,600 and um, we look forward to, to next year's events as well. So that concludes my report unless there's any questions from the board. All right, so I have two. Did we staff working on these things? Was that normal work time, or did we? we was there overtime? Or was, it was normal. It was over. It, normal. Normal work time. Okay. It was, o it was over normal work time. It was so over. Yeah. Okay, so there was additional expense that we had in addition to work that would have been done otherwise. Yes. So one of the ideas behind the uh, chili cook-off this year is to do it as a trial and see what we learn. So at some point, I guess, I would look to get some feedback in terms of uh, should we continue doing that one? You know, what, what should be different about it? Because I, what I never realized is how few of our customers attend this. It's just a, it's a fundamentally different. Maybe I should have known that, but it, it didn't occur to me until I walked around and didn't recognize anybody. <laughs> and I think some of that we might recover in a couple years because th this event was um, not run particularly well from in 2015 to 2016 and I think there were more homeowners. I mean, that oh, I see. Okay. It was a KCA run event so there would have been homeowners. Yeah. 
some people may have noticed some yeah. issues and maybe they didn't want to come this year. So okay. I, I mean, should you choose to continue it, I think that the homeowners would come back to it. Who would be my assumption? Okay, well, our guys, Simu and staff will look through this and sort of think about what would it mean to continue or not and then let us know your thoughts yes. on it. Yeah. But I also think we need to take into account intangible stuff. That, you know, yeah. Like it's, it is a form of marketing, Kirkwood, if it's done well. Yeah. And, um, yeah. That kind of thing. I mean, I just encourage you to sort of observe all that and sort of tell us. Anecdotally, from think. my side of the mountain, um, it was the first time I saw it advertised in the Ledger Dispatch. It may have been in the past, it's the first time I saw it. Um, quite a few amateur residents that spend their summer at Plasses came up that wouldn't have come up otherwise. I saw quite a few people that I know that I know are summertime residents at Plasses that wouldn't have been here normally, so that was a big positive in getting those people here, mm -hmm. which again are not normal residents here, right. but they're Amador County, which is, I don't know if they just didn't know about it in all these prior years. So that right. was that was one good takeaway I had in terms of the marketing aspect, Eric, that I think was important that was changed this year that actually had a really, from my perspective, I recognize 20% of the people as Amador County residents that I knew, so that was nice to see. Yeah, okay, good. Which I hadn't seen in years past. Okay, uh, Nancy, you have a, I'm sorry, Standish? So we don't include the, I guess I'll look at Kelly and Eric, and Rick. We don't include the labor costs, the overtime labor costs? It, it, it's not, we, there weren't overtime hours. It was, you know, regular right. hours. We didn't, I don't think anybody had any overtime on the thing, but it's, we code those hours to G&A. Yeah. And then, and, you know, a portion of those gets allocated to fire through the normal GNA allocation process, but we didn't code specific hours to the chili cook off to you know to the fire fund. It's it's all posted to GNA, and that's the way you know in, in the past with the with the uh, summer festival, and you know we just went along the same way with the uh, chili cook off to code those hours to GNA as a part of the. Yeah. District's uh, okay. contribution, but they're not incremental hours. They're not more additional hours that we wouldn't have incurred. It's just an allocation of existing. Right. Hours. It's, yeah. just, it's just and the hours were. Uh, staff labor didn't go to normal Sorry? tasks. Staff labor didn't go to normal <coughs> tasks that they would have been otherwise performing. If it's the board's predilection to do this again next year, we will code it separately and track it and include it yeah. in the net to get an accurate picture for this board of um, what the real implication is. I I think I'm against that, and the reason I asked the question is because we were looking at the incremental contribution of the July 4th barbecue a couple of years ago, and when you labor in, excuse me, when you layer in an allocation of costs, you don't get the true incremental contribution. So as long as it's not incremental hours that people are working, I don't think we should burden these events with uh, a labor allocation. Um, now, if you disagree, let's revisit it, but, you know, what... what when we did it your way a number of years ago, it looked like the barbecue was break even at best or down, and so we made the decision not to do that because it was an incremental, you know, fundraising source. Go into overtime. Into overtime. I mean, the, there's a lot of thought that goes into that in the execution of the event. Right. You know, and, and for supervising operations staff during the summer, we, we're stretched pretty thin. And this is just yet another activity that right. that impacts us um, across the board. We also we don't really leverage KPS and other entities in the valley, I think, as well as we could going forward. And that, that was one of my suggestions that I gave to Rick. And so I think that's a way to maybe lower our labor costs going forward if we can get other people to contribute and, and help as real partners in the event. Yeah, I think before we decide to not show all of these things, that that was kind of my question is, this is a good marketing event for the resort. They might reasonably expect it to contribute some amount of labor for that. So I would just encourage an internal discussion about it and tell us what, what, what our options are. Uh, I thought it was a good event. It was a great uh, event. I've never gone before because yeah. whenever I see KCA, I think tax, and I run the other way. So uh, <laughs> to the extent that it's... Uh, <laughs> as long as you have an open mind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't on that. <laughs> so I, I'd encourage us to try it for another couple of years if we think it's a good marketing event and 
make some incremental money. Yeah. So, what would you say to the run and the chili cook off weren't budgeted for? They weren't budgeted for. No. So they're okay. But the summer festival was. Yes. Okay. Okay, I think that's everything. Thank you. And we'll move on to item 8E. Uh, was there anything from operations you wanted to add on the cook-up? Okay, I assume not. Okay, so 8E, uh, iPad project. So Rick and yeah, I'm gonna Drew. Just brief introduction. Um, boy, staff is very pleased with this project and the, prog and the progression of it and how quickly changes are made. Um, to, to the app to, to help us along. So I've asked Drew to, to give a brief uh, a review of the iPad project and show some of the exciting features that are within it. So Drew, it's all to you. Thanks. Try to keep this brief. Um, I know everyone has had a long week, uh, but the uh, the Map App team have been very busy. Um, Bob and Corey have uh, added uh, the capability to add Knox box locations, upload photos for valves, hydrants, manholes, transformers. Um, photo uploads for properties and customers are coming, but if you now can click on a transformer and then you actually can see uh, we'll eventually have more pictures um, external picture from maybe in the road but then the internal picture for ops uh, so they can kind of see um, how many phases are on this transformer uh, just quick access without having to open up the transformer and physically look in it um, We've also added the ability to digitize our uh, valve exercising program. And now the app can not only log uh, which valves were exercised, but we can also uh, have reporting functions to show when valves were maintained, which valves require omni balls or work orders, stuff like that. Um, here's a sample of a normal water valve exercise. You can see. Basically, you have the valve elevation, uh, too high, too low, okay, lid status, valve ring conditions. Uh, is, is the Omni ball present, or is it some of the uh, propane uh, curb stops? Uh, it's just not applicable. It's, it's, it's a small shaft that the Omni balls will not fit in there. But um, yeah, well, the valve exercised. Uh, and then, of course, uh, work orders down here at the bottom, and then you can add some notes whatever the operators might want. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So down off of uh, Winter Green, there's a, there's a <coughs> type of water manhole. I don't know what that's called. But anyway, and there's the, a blue thing outside the, this water. A little blue ball kind of looking yeah. thing? So in other words, it would pick up something like that. But yes. I'm calling going, I've seen this ball. I've seen this. I thought it was a toy. Yeah, uh, what, what they use those for is, uh, especially in the wintertime when there's a lot of snow coverage over these uh, valves and, and manholes and meters, uh, they can take a uh, detector, essentially, and, uh, and hit it and know exactly where it's at. Um, so it's kind of novel, and they're very cheap. Uh, locator's a little more spendy, but the, uh, the actual Omni balls are pretty inexpensive. Um, so the app team has also uh, implemented the transformer maintenance option, which will digitally record two types of transformer inspections, uh, one being a detailed, which is uh, <coughs> required every five years. Bring that up here. Here's our uh, detailed inspection is every five years, patrol inspection every two years. Very similar to the 
valve exercising program, but uh, this will uh, record digitally uh, what we're required to show to the CPUC. Um, so we'll get off some paper, and uh, I think eventually it's just going to be a lot easier to, uh, with the reporting options, to not have to rifle through three ring binders and folders and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what's really exciting about this is that um, these list of questions that we've come up with, either transformers for valves or whatever hydrants, it allows the operator in the field to actually go through and, and inspect it. Uh, can you go back one? Oop, sorry. Okay. Transformer inspection, sorry. Or any inspection. Okay. There we go. So again, uh, it, it's, it's designed so it really makes it foolproof in the field that the operator can do a good thorough inspection on the piece of equipment, make notes, and in some cases introduce photographs. Um, and then if they fail to answer a question, uh, Bob and Corey have, have set up the default that they have to answer the question before they can move on. This allows us, as Drew mentioned before, for us to go paperless, but also for, for record keeping to see kind of where we are, what we need to address and, and go to. And it evolves every time we meet. Um, if there's an issue or if something becomes more cumbersome, Bob and Corey may to make quick changes so we can <coughs> make it more easy for everyone. So we're using this format, you know, simply for the infrastructure system now, but we're going to expand this out to the other pieces of equipment that we have in the valley. And then if you could go back to that very first slide, and this is something that uh, Eric uh, mentioned in one of the first meetings that we had was, I'll show the one with the purple lines of the transport. Let's see. This is a huge improvement over existing route sheets that would say, oh, this transformer here at this location serves these homes. Having a visual image of lines actually indicating which homes are affected. If we all lost this transformer for whatever reason, we can immediately operator know where to go versus trying to do an Easter egg hunt or pulling out old route sheets to understand who's out um, and get to them before they start calling us. So, uh, Anyway, Drew, I'll let you take it from here, but again, yeah, it's, it's really amazing how quickly these changes are happening, but I think in the long run, the data and the tracking that we'll have and the information that we <coughs> pass on to others is going to be invaluable. I concur. Uh, future development, uh, we, we are uh, now working on pretty much property tabs, if you will. Um, how to include customer contact info, alarm uh, company info, customer usage info, um, um, and then the ability to add pictures of, of these properties and not only the properties, the utilities. So when our uh, operators are in the field, again, no hunting and pecking around, uh, 10 feet of snow, they know exactly where these things are. It's, it's going to be a huge asset. Um, so each one of those items is located. Well, it, the, yes, I mean, why don't you do that? Well, what we discovered is you can do the latitude and longitude, but what works a lot better is um, Drew. Can you um, just uh, use the plus thing and zoom in? Yeah, a of bit? course. Um, Drew walks around the house, and we're sort of saying, "Do we really know where the propane shutoff is?" And he finds it. And you look right on the map, <laughs> and you find the rocks, and you mark it right there. Because what matters is, in the middle of the snow, you, you, can, go, you can go back to this same map. You see everything else around it. Whereas if all you knew were the latitude and longitude, you draw a circle of 20 feet around that point, and you know it's somewhere within there. But having the, 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 the picture reference yeah. makes it much faster. And so... We're going through, we'll, we'll find where everything is and then discover, oh, there's a clean-out <coughs> valve here. But the sewer might as well mark that, too. So yeah. over time, we just know everything about that property and with enough detail so somebody else could come in with 10 feet of snow and have a better idea of where it is than just knowing it's, it's in a circle. 
within this within this 20 foot radius. Yeah. So, uh, so some of this just in the image on a picture for is that all one? all of this are Google Maps, high resolution Google Maps with it, and he just drops a marker on there and says what it is. Okay, so it's not in a database in a sense. Yeah, it is. It, all, all these things are recorded in the database. Not in terms of an access database with Latin launch, I think is what you're asking. Yeah, right. No, because the accuracy of the iPads is so low that it's just a graphical representation. Well, what we found is, well, it's, it's to eight digits accuracy. But what we find is doing it on a picture, any errors in the picture are just everything, everything is offset by the same error. Mm -hmm. So finding it um, as on a, on a photograph of the image, it just works better than having, we, we still have, the, it's still recorded as a point, a latitude and longitude point. Well, it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it still is. You could load that into your Garmin thing. But you're not locating it on the iPad via the Latin launch. You're locating via the visual. Yeah, and our experience over the summer is it's it's faster and it seems yeah. to be more accurate. You can enter it either point. way. You can you can take a, a a Latin lawn and 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 put it in here and it'll make that point. But the problem with the Latin lawn is it's relative to that specific day and the errors <coughs> that occurred at the time you captured it. How many satellites are up? Yeah. Whereas marking it where it is on a photograph is going to be accurate. Yeah, as regardless, as it, yeah, as because as it's re relative to something like the shape of the building, right? and that, that's kind of the point is you can see exactly where you are on the building, and you and you can mark it uh, relative to the building, which seems to be more accurate. But I th the, yeah. yeah, I think what's also going to be key is is in, in the winter. Um, we all know East Meadows had some problems with flooding. Uh, now we have uh, culverts are marked, um, storm drains are marked. <laughs> So if there is an emergency that requires to dig out these culverts and storm drains, it's going to be pretty easy to find them. How thoroughly have you marked out storm drains and culverts? Um, pretty darn thorough. Um, so and you can actually see the drain on the image. Yeah, so you just yeah put a exactly. Marker over it. When you zoom, zoom in on these Google Maps and, and marking, marking these storm drains, you can literally see the storm drain lid or you can see the culverts. I think it's going to be a big help. As you can see right here is a storm drain and you got sure one right one. here. If you click the on SD it. The SD is a storm drain and then these little black lines are culverts. <clears throat> well, let me click on a storm drain. You can't get the Latin launch uh, here. And the idea is that if there's any ever any maintenance done on that, that would be recorded there also. Uh, what's also nice about this is, is I, I can't tell you how many manholes I found that were paved over. Um, so in the future, if that does happen again, we won't have to go out there with a metal detector and try to fish around for these manholes. We're gonna we're gonna know within a, a couple feet where they're at, and you can just easily hit them with the detector and then chip out the asphalt. I think it's gonna be a big help. Helps me eye uh, as far as um, <clears throat> completion of this, uh, we finished all of the east side, uh, most of commercial, uh, finished uh, Fremont, Fremont Court, and uh, pretty much up to Hawkweed right now. So I just need Hawkweed, Merrill, and Dangberg. I think we'll be, we'll, I'm pretty confident we're going to be finished mapping the majority of the infrastructure and utilities uh, by this winter. That was what I was trying to push for. So just, just the top level over on this, the original, my original motivation for encouraging this is the next time there's a, an incident at a, at a location and there's a lot of snow <coughs> and we want to know where everything is and everything that we could possibly help in terms of their, in terms of the operation that it, we have our best possible chance of knowing where it is. And in the process of finding anything, everything, we're doing a 100% inspection of everything we care about and knowing what, what needs to be done. So that, that's kind of number one of what we're trying, of, of the reason for doing it. As a side benefit, it's just possible to digitize every single aspect of our infrastructure. And that, that pays off over time. It's a, 
it's a cost when you first do it, but it, it'll it'll pay off. It'll pay off over time. <coughs> um, the next step that will involve the homeowners is um, we want to be able to have a prioritized list of who to contact in an emergency. So if you think of like an alarm service, you normally say, you know, who's the primary contact? If you can't reach them, who do you call? Who do you call? Down, down the list. So to implement something like that, which is voluntary if customers choose to do it, then we have a more accurate way of, no, of, of notify, notification in the event uh, of an issue. So we, we would do that. We'd also use it as a way of reminding them of their responsibilities in terms of safety, uh, which is something brand new we'll talk about uh, coming up. But this is a way of sort of having it all in one place online. Yeah, huge safety aspects. Uh, I know when the Merrill uh, House went up the... Noya's residence. Um, it was it was troublesome to find these uh, propane valves, and I mean we had snow on the ground, snow on the roads. Um, I think it's just going to be a huge a huge asset just to look at a map and oh, there's a cluster of three propane valves right here, um, and knowing what they serve, it, it's just yeah, it's going to be huge. Uh, any questions? Yeah. <coughs> All right. Thank you, Drew. Okay, and speaking of safety, let's talk about propane safety. Brandy? Um, as you know, we have gone out uh, this summer uh, to do an inspection of all propane meters, <coughs> and we've made over 20 um, recommendations of propane meters that were not adequately protected. Um, this is a, a, a major issue in heavy snowfall when um, people are not at the residence to dig out their meters. Um, so we sent letters out to these customers um, requesting that they uh, build adequate protection or do other things to improve the safety of their propane meters. Um, so in your packet, I included a spreadsheet showing the customers that were contacted, um, the ones that have completed um, repairs. Those are shown in green. Uh, and I'm happy to report that more than half have completed um, improvements to their propane meters. Um, this is a requirement of propane service <coughs> that they provide a structure acceptable to the district for protecting their meter. I've shown here a couple of structures that have been built um, that have improved the safety uh, of the propane meters. So left after our last inspection were nine meters that needed additional propane protection either started or finished. Um, four of these nine have started work and uh, the estimated completion date is by the end of next week. Um, so I've talked to those. We have two additional customers who have started work but I have not gotten a completion date estimate yet, um, which leaves only three uh, that are still kind of unknown. Um, and of these three, two of them are not protection structures. Uh, they are customers where we've identified a possible need to support pipes. Um, the, the propane meter itself is under a structure, under a deck, where it, it's not the same sort of building that needs to be done here. Um, so we only have one customer left that needs to build protection uh, as of our last inspection. Um, we have identified the curb stop valve for that customer in case uh, we get to a point where we do need to shut that off at the street. Um, we will be doing a final inspection on Monday. Uh, the deadline that we have given them is the 15th, which is Sunday. So we'll do a final inspection Monday, um, see where we're at, and then do any final communication with the customers um, to get them to comply. But overall, we have had a very good um, effort by all of our customers to meet our requirements um, and the structures that have been built. We have inspected. We've made sure that we feel they are um, adequate. They allow venting um, and are going to be much safer for this winter. 
Um, so the remaining customers, are they resistive or just unresponsive? Um, both of them have indicated to me um, via email or phone call that they are working on it. Okay. Um, but I just haven't, it has not been completed to date, and I have not gotten okay. uh, any indication of when that might be. So obviously, within our right to shut it off, they've been notified, but we don't really want to freeze their house either. Right? Correct. So. I, I'm optimistic yeah. that, okay. that they will get it done. Yeah. Nancy. Um, so if I look at the list, and from what I think I heard said, um, is two of those two two problems are bail related. So are they responsive or not responsive? Um, I have met with them as well. Uh, they understand the issue and have indicated that they are going to be doing something. I I have not had a completion date, but I have met with them on site uh, to look at the problem. You know, um, the the letters went out to uh, Tom Porch and the operations manager, so I, I have not spoken to Doug about it. But we will. We have the power to get compliance. We do. Good. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll move on to 8G then, you to update on utility rules and regulations. Great. That is me as well. Um, as you know, we have been in a process of updating what started with electric and propane rules and regulations. Um, in our efforts to do that, it became apparent that the district policy statements uh, governing all of our utilities uh, needed to be updated. And I have met with Eric and we've discussed my efforts so far to get those updated. Um, in light of those efforts, it's become apparent that we also need to update our design standards um, for all of our utility departments. Um, so this is something that Eric and I are going to be working on together. It has, it has grown the more we look at it. Um, so this is going to be a winter project that we focus on. Um, hopeful uh, target completion date of February of next year to give a complete package of electric propane rules and regulations, policy statements, and design standards. And that would be the draft one before the committee and then ultimately the board. So we're hoping to get the draft done in February. And then with the committee's blessing, possibly a May date, that's what we probably target for a full board review. Now, in the process, could we end up with new design things for which there are current customers that are inadequate? Yes. Um, what I can tell you is standards are always changing, and the house that you had built in 1970 doesn't uh -huh. comply with the current building code that's been adopted by the state of California. Okay. It does mean we're retroactively looking to go after someone who built their home in 1974. Okay. But if they did a remodel, they'd be subject to the new standards. Okay. So we're not looking to go after anybody, for, but we do need to bring our – I mean, for example, our wastewater standards still have clay pipe in it, Almost nobody uses, you know, uh, <coughs> clay pipe anymore, VC pipe. So right. it's okay. just things that need to be cleaned up, it's things we reference that don't exist anymore, things that have changed over time. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's a ground, it's a, it's a burn down the old and start brand new. There is yeah. nothing to salvage. We avoid fires in this, <laughs> in this district. <laughs> Trash the old and start with the new, sorry. <laughs> okay. Accepted. Uh, Nancy, have a So, so just, a, just a comment. So if I think about PMA, the way we operate as far as, um, you know, our planning committee, usually during the wintertime is when our uh, members do their, oh, I'm going to build a garage, I'm going to add on, or whatever. And obviously we tell them to start in the winter so that by the time you know, construction season starts, so you can start start going. So I just comment on that just so, you know, there's, that, there's a lot of money that people spend and invest in those types of uh, things that they're going to do their property. So you know, from a timing standpoint, when is something going to be implemented? If I spent all winter having a certain design and part of the process is I have to give my plans to the PUD and now you change them, holy cow. So I guess I would also encourage you to somehow communicate that out, that you're going to be reviewing design standards 
I mean, I don't have the answer, but... Well, I think there's a misunderstanding, perhaps, Nancy. Our design standards end at the property line, essentially. Oh, okay. So all of what you're talking about is the building departments with the respective counties. What we care about is where our facilities are. We don't care what happens downstream of our meter. That's up to the county to allow. We don't care what happens downstream of the sewer clean or upstream of the sewer clean out on a property. All those things are within the county's purview, and we do not review nor have any authority over those, with the exception of the propane meter itself on the property. Not the line to it, not the line out of it, just the propane meter. Those things will not change in our standards. Unless somebody was cutting in a new sewer line or a new water service, which would be unlikely for an existing house, so KMA would generally not have that issue. I don't see that as a, I mean, it could happen. We have one right now on Fremont where they're cutting in a new sewer line. Um, and that's really what's brought to light the deficiency of our standards. Um, we have old asbestos concrete pipe, which requires special handling. Uh, the contractor was unaware of his obligations under Cal OSHA, and having to educate him on those issues was interesting. And uh, we hope to have our standards such that it is an open book, people can read it, follow step A to B, and there is no confusion in the future. So. I don't see it as a big issue, but if someone is going to undergoing that, I, I think if they want to know what we're working on, we won't. Have, we could have drafts done, but the ultimate adoption is at the pleasure of the board. It's strictly suggestions from staff. But if I, I don't see that we could include something in our um, newsletter saying that we're updating the standards, if you plan on doing anything, tying new tie-ins for water, wastewater, sewer, or electric, and you want a copy of the draft standards, which are yet to be adopted, and you follow at your own risk, we could put something in there to that effect, and I think that's a good idea. A good idea. Welcome. Okay, uh, any other questions on the data rules and regs? Okay, then let's move on to 8H, uh, update on the solid waste contracts. Rick? So we received a proposal from ACES, um, just to let the board know, and I think most of you know I have a very long relationship with both Paul Sr. and Paul Jr., very good friends of mine. So I've completely stepped aside from working on the ACES contract simply because they were both directors at my prior work, and uh, they are good friends of mine. So Rick has handled this um, from the ground up, and I have kept my hands out of it. So just so the board's fully aware, full disclosure. Thank you. So as the board is aware, um, Paul Molinelli Sr. Uh, approached Michael Sharp with uh, a proposal to uh, uh, advise or, or uh, continuing on with the relationship with ACES and the district um, with a Fifth Amendment of the contract, which has been in effect since 1998. Um, and this contract expires on December 2019. Uh, Paul's intent and reasoning was that he just uh, would ensure that he can continue the relationship for st strategic business planning for his, for his organization. Um, at the last board meeting, uh, staff was directed to seek other bids and possibly other rates, uh, and I reached out to South Tahoe Refuge, who sent their general manager and uh, several of their staff members out to review our operations with myself and the water superintendent, Derek, who, who is managing our solid waste program here. Um, we actually have nine collection centers. You know, it's not just the wastewater treatment plant containers that you see on the screen here. You know, we, uh, we roll dumpsters at Snowcrest, Meadowstone, the Lodge, Mountain Club, Sun Meadows, Base Camp, E Meadows, and of course there are containers outside at the towers and the powerhouse as well. Um, currently, as you know, our contract has us owning 14 two-yard containers and three three-yard containers with an agreement with ACES to, um, if we uh, pay for the materials, they'll, they'll actually take the containers down to their, to their main uh, facility and, and paint them for us, put new stickers on, clean the hinges and repair hinges um, and weld wheels on if they fall off and so forth. So we've had a good relationship with ACES. Um, South Tower Refuge uh, indicated that they would have a, uh, one, an interest to provide services for us, but two, to um, reflect in their proposal um, similar types of activities as well. But 
Uh, long story short, um, speaking with Paul Molinelli, he's asked me to rescind the request at this time to renew the contract. And then um, in light of that information, it's staff's recommendation to defer the review of this contract until early 2019 where we could probably go out to an RFP and solicit other bids. So at this time, again... Uh, Why did he ask to withdraw? He didn't indicate any particular reason. Just wanted to rescind it at this time. Knowing that the contract, again, is two years away for expiration. So when would we do our RFP? Probably begin the process in January 2019. Um, give us time and due diligence to thoroughly review um, and have the opportunity for others to solicit a bid. Okay. I, I think we'd look to see the RFP, pro the actual proposals be delivered. I think we talked about May, which Correct. would give time to go through the committee and the board for approval and then work out the contract language on the back end, uh, essentially a full year to do that. Mm -hmm. It's a conservative estimate, but we don't mm -hmm. want to run out of waste. Right. Solid waste service. Right. Okay. Uh, yes. Nancy. Do, does ASAP do anything for us that doesn't cost anything? In other words, I think about the, the dumpsters that show up at Labor Day, 4th of July, and I think about all the stuff that gets thrown in there. I mean, <coughs> when I lived in Southern California, you'd never be able to. Those are donated by ASAP. Yeah. So I don't know how you quantify that, but yeah. That's a huge benefit to the community. Yeah, ASAP has always provided what I consider excellent service um, and in donating these containers during the holiday periods um, and making an effort to drive around um, the long way when the Carson Spur is closed to, to ensure that we're, we're tipped um, in a timely fashion. Uh, their new driver, Blaine, um, and as I expressed to Paul today, um, is doing an outstanding job understanding our operations and anticipating our needs and if uh, if we're not there at 7 a.m. to meet him to, to roll a dumpster out, he's making efforts, efforts to do it as well. And so, again, the relationship we have with ACES is, is, is very good. Um, so. Is the district required to take the lowest bid? District is required to take the lowest responsive bidder. Okay, thank you. Got it. Actually, it's responsible and responsive. Thanks. Okay. Uh, thank you very much on that. Well, I, I think and, I was, and just yeah, to that, sorry. just to that point. I mean, it's it's kind of the way. I think the electric. We did this with the Out Valley. <clears throat> you know, there are some qualitative things that you put into the proposal, right? That you can somehow objectively measure or objectively evaluate. That, so it's not. I think it doesn't have to be just the cost, the, the dollars and cents. It's also, you know, willingness to, or the ability to go around the spur, for example, and I don't, know, I, I don't know exactly how you state those things, but I know you can do it. Yeah, you yeah, absolutely can. And it's anything over 25000 by the way, that you have to go through that uh, public contract code process. So we do have some leeway for lesser contracts. Okay, any other questions? All right, I'll move on to two quick items here. Item. 8i is a formal approval of the general manager contract, which was signed by Pete and myself and by Eric, but requires uh, formal board approval. So the contract's in your packet. We're not proposing any changes, but I'd like a motion to approve the uh, contract. I'll make the motion. Okay. Standish moves. So second. Okay. Jeff seconds. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. That passes unanimously. And then similar item on 8 J, we did not actually formally have the board approve the um, the interim agreement with uh, Michael to provide services as needed, and I'll ask Eric to comment on how that's going for him. I mean, it's primarily to help you. Sure, and, and it has it has been a, of, a, of invaluable assistance in understanding some issues, uh, most particularly uh, the PG&E ongoing negotiations, and that's. Uh, the predominant area in which I relied on Michael's assistance, um, which I think Standish and Bob would attest to. Um, with regards to other items, it's it's been 
minimal, but when I've needed it, he's been very quick to respond. I'm sure there's landmines out there that I haven't found yet that I will be calling him to ask him about, but so far out of the half dozen things that Michael and I have conversed on, I think only one has been outside of the PG&E scope. So um, it's, it's, been, it's been helpful, and uh, after the signature card is signed today, that will reduce his hours here every Wednesday in terms of check signing. That's one that will go away after today. Um, but it hasn't been an exorbitant cost to the district. He's been very fair in his billing, so I've been very pleased with it. Okay. And there's a maximum of hours there as to not risk anything in terms of his retirement, but it's unlikely we would ever right. get close to that, to that number. So I'd like a motion to formally approve his so contract. Did they move by Eric? Second? Second. Okay, seconded by Jeff. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, that passes unanimously. Yes? Yeah. Is, is Michael classified as an employee or as a consultant or as a kind of quasi? Uh, he is he is an assistant general manager part time. Um, is whether that's an employee or not? He's still an employee. We still yeah, go through so. the payroll process. Yeah. Yes, it's not a consultant agreement. Yeah. Uh, okay. So with that completes item eight. Let's move on to nine general managers. Report. Sure. Uh, many of you have already heard quite a bit of this at various committee meetings, but I just wanted to provide a, provide a few updates for the benefit of the other board members. Um, we've received two out of area service requests for electric service. Uh, I think, believe the board's aware of the Peddler Hill maintenance station. Caltrans um, re-indicated their great desire for that at the economic development meeting uh, yesterday as well. We are currently awaiting their deposit for the services that Michelle Gamble at RCI will be rendering in terms of guiding them through the process. It's out of our service area, so it has to go through PG&E, CPUC for us to serve outside our area, so she's going to guide them through that process. We've also received a request from El Dorado Irrigation District relative to uh, the Silver Lake West Campground that they own and operate. It's not a large service, but uh, since they have the concession at K's and um, Kit Carson and whatnot, there may be some uh, benefit there that they're looking at. So we have a meeting with them on Monday to look at additional service. Um, as these service requests come in, it's become a pretty standard protocol of how we proceed through it, and it, again, only benefits our rate payers if we're able to provide service to additional customers, especially if they're high-usage customers. Any uh, do we have, have we come up with any just sort of framework about how we would I mean, how we would um, charge these customers? I mean, do we have any conceptual framework at all about that? I mean, in terms of rates? My answer is no. Yeah. I would say we have no. Yeah, we, well, we, we know two things. Um, PG&E can't, they'd be, it is PG&E territory okay. that we're talking about. So PG&E would not charge them a special rate. They, I mean, they, all their customers are the same rate. So but the rate at which we would charge PG&E would roughly would, equal our monthly O&M cost. Well, we'd have to figure out. <laughs> I'm sure we could figure that out, but we, we would have to figure out what's a compensation that's, that fairly compensates us. That how actually that gets billed back to the customer, I think, is not... That's up to PG. That'd be up to PG. &E. It's up to PG, &E, but it's not. I mean, that's how that how that's done. Is that that's what Stanish is saying? Hasn't been figured out. But if we have, if we have more than just PG and E servicing Caltrans, we're in a better position to figure that out because then we can't. You know, we have to be equal to all of the customers, and so building up a customer list gives, puts us in a better position to try to figure it out. Even if some of them discover that it's totally financially not feasible to, for such a small load to convert 33,000 volts down to a, a service. Well, so let me ask this just, can I discuss this now? Or, or? Discussion, but no action, of course. Yeah. yeah. So my basic question is, again, just conceptually. <clears throat> On the one hand, we know that every increment of money that comes along that line will help, helps us. Right. And, and ultimately helps our customers. Right. Um, on the other hand, if that increment isn't large enough so that essentially, I mean, a lot of ratepayers, not including me probably, would say, well, we're subsidizing these people's use of electricity. 
yes, it's helping us out, but it's also subsidizing. I mean, this came up in the discussions with the EV chargers, charging stations. You know, can we lower the rate, you know, to, mm -hmm. because in fact, every incremental piece of revenue helps us on the one hand, but on the other hand, others are saying, yeah, but we're subsidizing this person's ability to charge their car versus what I pay for my everyday things. So I just think that there's a, a thing there that we got to sort of figure out. I don't think there would be any rate structure for any customer, any new customers out of the area that would be a lesser rate than what existing customers pay. So there wouldn't be any subsidization, and any infrastructure that would have to be built relative to those customers would have to be built and paid for by the developer or customer in this case. Caltrans would have to build the step down uh, and the facilities they needed to meet her. So, is there additional O and M with that? Yes, there would be additional O and M, but that could be captured if we wanted to look at that um, for out of valley customers. But it's going to vary from customer to customer, so some standardization would need to be looked at. We're, we're just down the theoretical path at this point, well, but well, right. something we'll need well, to. I guess, right, but, but I think that in discussion with the potential customers, I think that they should have some sense of what it is that we would intend to do, and I don't know what that is at this point. We're still exploring what the numbers might be, but there will be no circumstance under which there's a subsidy from us to the customers. That would never occur. Um, I think the, our ability to have special tariffs, you know, if, if we charge 66 cents to charge your vehicle, at some point people are going to say, I'm just not going to charge it. That's an uncompetitive right. rate. Having a special tariff for vehicles would benefit everybody. Right. And so we would only do it under circumstance where our customers benefit. But that doesn't necessarily mean <clears throat> that the answer is 66 cents in every case. Well, no. Well, first of all, the PG would be charging them. We wouldn't be charging them. We'd be charging PG to use our line, right. right? That's right. And so the question is: is do we load in our full cost of all of our PG&E costs, a pro rata share of our rust debt, uh, our pro rata share of our maintenance of, of our lines, and all those things? Which I don't know what get, I don't know what that gets to, but it's we'll say it gets to sixty-five cents. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so if all, all those is things would be in there their standard rate, they're by definition losing money on that. Um, okay, well, I, it's just I'm not trying to come up with a solution. I just wanted to make, right. make sure that... Okay, so we currently... Framework our we reimbursement have. rate for net energy uh, generation, mm -hmm. if you go over your 100% right. usage, is 13 cents. So we've reached a decision that 13 cents is our marginal cost. So if you took 66 cents and subtracted 13, there's an argument that we should charge 53 cents to deliver a kilowatt to a customer near us. Now PG&E, uh, they, they have their own cost of power and the rest of that. So if we, ch just theoretically, if we charge 53 cents, we'd be completely consistent with what we do with our current uh, solar customers. And if PG&E ended up charging 60 cents, that six cents difference is just their their marginal cost of power is less than ours. So there's an argument for I just made an argument for 53 cents as the rate we should charge, but I don't know that that's the right number. No, and, yeah. the, and those numbers should these pan out? Should these go forward? And I think Caltrans will go forward. Um, provided pg and &E is also willing, um, will be brought back before the board for determination of the appropriate rate. And whether that's another rate study or whether it's back in the napkin calculation, I like Bob's math, that may be the right number. It's, that will be back before the board. No decisions will be made. There will be no subsidization, I'm sure, of that. And then, of course, the other thing is I don't think these are <coughs> really huge users of electricity, but, again, we don't want to jeopardize our capacity. No, no, th there's... Looking at the potential usage of the customers uh, that have come along and asked, um, that since that came up the other day, I did go back and look at the potential uses of the list that I think uh, of everybody along the way that stand a ship prepared. Just looking at that, uh, there's no capacity risk to serve yeah, full I, build I, out I of believe, the valley. I believe that. So do I. Yeah. Yeah. 
the deposit that you referred to, Eric, is yes. that non-refundable? It's a, it's a time of materials deposit okay. based on actual costs incurred. Okay. The actual costs incurred in this case are mostly RCI's time. There will be some st district staff time, which we're going to be tracking as well, so to make sure we're made whole. But RCI prepared a scope and fee, which Caltrans has, and they will be providing that deposit. And should they exceed it, they'll be billed. Should they be under it, they will be refunded, just as any other customer is. Okay. So much easier pg and &E just owns the line. <laughs> Something to be said for that. Uh, quick, uh, anything else on that before we move on? A uh, quick update on grants. I did receive um, a report from RCI looking into grants. Uh, unfortunately, the only three that they were able to identify are inapplicable to the uh, district and our normal purview of operations. Um, so that was a bit disappointing. On the other hand, um, I have signed up the district and through through me for uh, multiple grant uh, opportunities that I know are available. They're pretty active. Um, as soon as the grant and funds become available, they send out emails to everybody on their list. I'm familiar with their websites. I'm familiar with both applying for and administering these various grants. So we're dealing with the state in multiple different facets. Um, the FAST grant program incorpor incorporates all of the State Water Resources Control Board, which is the Prop 83, Prop 1 money. Prop 1 money has gone, of course. Prop 83 continues on. Um, that is water and wastewater. Those are huge ones that we need to be looking at and being proactive. We have planned capital improvements for the next five years, which make it easy to look at those grants and look for those opportunities that, and fit the square hole into the round peg. You just have to hit it really hard. It works fine. <laughs> Uh, we also have a, uh, signed up for the FEMA Firefighter Grant Program that is closed for the year, but they will be opening up with new grant applications coming in January, February, which will provide us some opportunities. That's both for personnel, equipment, and PPE. So it covers the gamut. I've also signed up for Cal OES's uh, grant program, which covers essentially the same thing. It's a little bit different. So we're being pretty proactive in looking for these things um, as they come out. We will be on them. We know what projects we need to do. Um, I've rapidly come up to speed on that, so hopefully nothing will pass us by because we're being so proactive to know as these grants come out and see if they fit us. So we're, we're working really hard on that. Um, as those come up, I imagine I'll be writing the grant applications as they come up and getting those out. So any questions on that? No, that's great, though. Uh, bad, the bad news now. Um, absorption bed pump and VFD. So we did have a final design prepared or design analysis <coughs> prepared by RCI. They did a full water model analysis, or in this case, effluent water analysis of the absorption beds and the pumps. Um, Mark Frederick had suggested a 15 horsepower pump. Both Michelle Gamble and I were uncomfortable assuming that that would work, although anecdotally it would. So she did a full analysis, uh, which I've reviewed. I concur with their assessment, which is the 15 horsepower pump will work. However, in low flow situations, it will be um, significant uh, surge dosing and a significant uh, higher electrical cost if we don't do it as surge dosing. So she is recommending a variable frequency drive of VFD, which was in the original proposal for Mark Fredericks. Um, I concur that that is a necessity to operate this pump efficiently, both for O&M, both for uh, in addition to cost, in addition to longevity of the equipment, it lends itself to the equipment lasting a bit longer by having that sort of equipment installed. Um, so my intent would be to go ahead and have Mark Fredericks install the pump with the VFD. Um, so that's going to be another about $30,000 hit. If we didn't do the VFD, it's about 18000 I think it's going to pay off for us in the long run. Time value of money, it will actually be cheaper in the long run. It's just a capital hit now to a system that, unfortunately, is taking another capital hit with the centrifuge. Well, that absorption, I mean, if my memory is right, <clears throat> we felt that for that we felt for this year or for this, um, I guess there's an overlap from last year and this year. We had 120 thousand dollars to to spend on the wastewater system as a whole. 
Um, and I, from the numbers I've seen from all the, the videoing and um, so on, I don't think we've come close to that, have we? I don't think we've come close to spending that kind of money. No. So, I mean, I think that somehow it was in, our, in the budget, the $50,000 that was specific to this year and 70000 that had not been spent previously, I think. I mean, it's the use of cash, obviously, but I don't think it's a surprise. Any questions on that? Um, safety equipment, uh, as I've gone around, there's um, a few things that I've, I've seen that I wanted to implement right away. Um, so I have went ahead and um, lift two, I believe. Um, it's a very, it's about a 20 foot deep, 18 foot deep shaft. Uh, there's a ladder down to it. There's no uh, fall arrest protection on that ladder. Um, it is a confined space. If someone were to fall in there, you'd have to get the tripod out. You have to go through a whole rescue process to get them out. Um, and there is ga potential gaseous issues in there. We do have a sniffer that's not hooked up that is going to be rectified. Um, it's a checks for you know, you know carbon monoxide, ammonia, those sorts of gases. But I am going to have a safety climb installed and provi and provide harness for employees. So should they fall off the ladder. Their fall is arrested, so they don't hit the ground 20 feet down. Um, so I went ahead, and that's about a thousand dollars, just shy, between eight and eight hundred and a thousand dollars. I went ahead and implemented that, so I wanted the board to be aware of that. I've also ordered Class Three uh, safety vests. We've been recently working on the highway. Class Three vests are required. We don't have a lot of Class Three vests. I think we have one. So we, uh, I have went ahead and ordered Class 3 vests as well. It will have uh, KMPUD stenciled on the back, so residents and everyone will know who we are when we're out in those vests. No question, is that veil? Is that a contractor? They'll know who we are. Um, so if there's any issues, they know who to whom to call. And so we're slowly implementing quite a bit of PPE and safety equipment that I've found. Uh, we've scheduled safety, um, trench safety uh, seminar along with a confined space seminar for all staff, which they haven't had, I think, since about 2011 or 12. So some things that I've just seen, I've done quite a few ride-alongs. I know we talked about that during the interview process. I think I've done about six so far, and these are just in six rides. These are the things I've come up with that we need to implement right away just for the safety of our personnel. Uh, insurance claim is significantly more expensive than paying for, paying for these options, so we're working on that. Any questions? Excellent. Uh, we had the economic development meeting yesterday, which was actually surprisingly well attended. Um, for a lot of people that have forgotten, for me, failing to get out notice in a timely manner, and I take full responsibility for that. Um, but we did have a good meeting. Um, so of particular interest to Standish is that the new flashers that they're going to have in the icebox, um, and that ultimately they're going to have a ARIS system, I believe is it called, which is a, they'll have the tech, um, loop uh, electric loops in the road that will detect temperature and icy conditions and will warn people via a changeable message sign of those conditions so that was really a positive uh, development from that yeah and let me say it over the previous year and a half of trying to get action on that resulted in studies but no action so in some sense i think rick believes that getting them in the room and having them look face to face actually caused action yeah, it was, it was great. It was good news. Um, quite a few other topics that had lingered over are still continuing on, so we will uh, follow up on a meeting in May, but we're going to be sending monthly meeting reminders as well as monthly action item reminders to all the people that were uh, party to the economic development meeting. Um, so they will be people, will hopefully we'll get follow through on some of these action items. Um, Supervisors Woodrow and Morgan um, definitely have been helpful on the uh, sell issue, at least in terms of pursuing it. Unfortunately, it doesn't look like there will be any action. AT&T per Supervisor Woodrow has no interest in doing anything further up here, and Verizon is adding eight new towers, but they all appear to be down the hill on the western side. Possibly one at Peddler Hill was the only positive. So there may be a little bit of coverage for everybody going through that section. Any questions on that? Anything to add, Bob or Standish? Well, will there be follow-up on the cell thing? I know Standish mentioned Absolutely. as well. So. 
Yeah. All these I mean, items will be fine. It actually sounds more promising than I thought it was going to sound. Well, that's good. Um, I think the only thing I'd like to add is just the big picture. The goal in starting this effort was to say, so I get a weekly complaint about our rates from somebody, and I think they're really high. <laughs> so I can't, uh, um, so I think in terms of getting the rates down here, the, there's only two, there's three main ways. One is efficiency, and I feel like we've kind of done most of what we're going to find there. There'll still be some odds and ends. Uh, the second is, is paying down debt, um, and that's, we know what rate we can do that. And the third is if there's more economic activity, every extra person in a chairlift, um, we, go, we get more in our budget, and it costs us 13 cents. We collect 66, and we can use that to, to lower our rates. So the whole goal in the economic development was instead of pleading with Vail to stay open longer, which they'll just ignore, in fact, I they think they took it the opposite by a approach. week, yeah. Yeah, they've, they've shortened it to April 8th this, uh, this year. So that doesn't seem to be a successful strategy. <laughs> so instead, it's sort of saying, well, what are the things that can be done here that would increase visitor, you know, increase uh, construction or increase uh, visitors uh, to the valley? And that was the goal in putting this together, I think, my feeling there's a couple of things. One is timely information. If you want to come here, could you actually get here? And so I think the priority, as far as Doug's concerned, is to finish that process. The Highway Patrol is willing to provide more information. Uh, we can set up the systems to get it out. So that, that would at least increase. I'd like to come. Is it possible? That's one issue. I think um, the, the second one is if I get here, will I be turned away because there's no parking? And that is a mixture of a parking plan and also getting some parking space back that's currently lost to snow storage. And I think there's, there's opportunities within that. Uh, there's a third issue in my mind, which is the third world look of this place with the potholes everywhere uh, and the rest of that. That was a spirited discussion. Uh, but there is the basic fact that it's not even safe to drive a car uh, in uh, in the air, and so how does you know? So how does that all, how does that all fit in? So the top line goal is really to have a, a vehicle of trying to figure some of these things out and saying are the right people working on it. And I think just the presence of having everybody, all agencies that service this area being in the same room, seems to have some intangibles that are that are helping. So we're going to meet um, twice a year for as long as it's productive, but it's not really our meeting. We're just encouraging it. So somehow we need to figure out a way to rotate <laughs> the responsibility. We'll get started on that. Are you familiar, is anyone familiar with the website, the, the service Nixle, N-I-X-L-E? No. It's actually, a, came across this because of the fires of Marin. We were All alerted right. to it because we were wondering what was going on. Um, it's a service, um, and it's not clear to me of looking at the website what portion is free. It's free for someone like me to look, put in my zip code and look at, but it's a, it's a place where public agencies post quick notices. And I, I went on, I tried, you know, my zip code, Menlo Park, 94025, I tried up here, 956, and there's, there's people, po agencies post stuff. And all you have to do is go to the website and see, and it gives... Posting after posting. I mean, just quick things, you know. And I just don't know if I don't know if Caltrans. I think I have a feeling Caltrans uses it. So, yeah, we'll use it. Caltrans Twitter account is quite accurate. It's more accurate than the signs at South Lake Tahoe. <laughs> yeah. Confirm that. Yeah. Anyway, I just <coughs> came that across this N I X L E. Yeah, I added it to my bookmarks to go back and look at later. Yeah. Thanks, sir. Yeah. That could be. Thank helpful. you. Okay, so that's the economic development. Well, speaking of third world countries, let's yes. talk about Loop Road. <laughs> uh, so Beautiful. pretty much since my first week here, that's been a topic of discussion, um, both between, but mainly between myself and, and Doug, but also somewhat <coughs> with, with other parties as well. Um, the district is pursuing mm -hmm. having the major impediments to 
life and safety resolved. Uh, Vail, as per, and I will quote, and I quote, we have no money, end quote. Um, however, it's a life and safety issue, and we'll be pursuing it as such, and Doug's been made aware of that. Um, there may be an opportunity for to help them with something that they need with a little more storage area and, and to exchange for getting that accelerated. If it's not accelerated, it will ultimately be rectified in one manner or the other, um, and staff's working on it. Um, I like to play poker, so I'm not revealing my whole hand, but know that staff is diligently working on it. I think Rick and I and Brandy and I probably talk about it at least once a day, maybe once every other day. Maybe I'm being overly <laughs> exaggerating slightly, but we do talk about it and uh, we are pursuing it. So. Yes. So the, I know the, H, uh, um, the HOAs are chattering amongst themselves, um, uh, doing a red, uh, email campaign to Doug. So the, the bottom line is, is will it get done before, you know, the first snowplow has to go out? I can't say whether it will be done before the snow, first snowplow has to go out. I can't answer that. But I can't say that it will be done one way or the other. Okay, so it's possible that it won't Why don't you ask if it will be done before the back side opens? There you go. Okay. okay. I think that's likely. Okay. All right. Thanks. I'm optimistic. All right, uh, briefly, one of the things that came out of the economic development meeting and we'll probably be bringing back as an agendized topic for this board at the next meeting is the storm drain system and whether this board wants to form an ad hoc committee to investigate offering contract services, offering O&M, seasonal services, once a year services, take over the system if people don't want them, uh, analyzing all options. But that will be back before the board for consideration by the entire board to decide whether they want to do it. But the appropriate venue would be an ad hoc committee if they did to perform that investigation. So um, staff's aware of the um, interest by quite a few parties um, in different aspects of it. Some want option A, some want option Z, um, looking at those things. But that will be a discussion for this whole board to have. So I just want to make you aware that that will be get all your uh, shotguns loaded with whatever ammo you have for the various uh, options and we'll be talking about it at the next board meeting. Yeah, so that was actually the planning committee uh, that we, we talked about this. Um, and uh, coming in, into this meeting, um, it was simply going to be a request to agendize it, uh, both on the committee and, and at the board, which is what we talked about, which is great. But I thought probably the first important step before anything could happen would be garner, uh, garnering the, the HOA's interest um, in, in having that service, but also would they be willing to map out where their storm drain system is. Now I find out Drew's already done it. <laughs> so, yeah. So that's a great thing. That problem anyway. solved. Anyway. But I think our interest is just that the next rain on snow event doesn't flow fresh water into our well, it's not only collection system, right? I mean, that's, that's our primary interest. Well, it's, it's not only rain on snow. I mean, I remember, I think it was a year ago, a, a good-sized storm, I think it was in October last year, where at the bottom of our street, Sorrel and so on, yeah. it was, it was um, basically Late. flooded because the culvert system, the culvert there was completely clogged up. And I remember Michael calling up Gene Solberg and saying, hey, do you want us to do something about this? Because I'm worried about water getting into our infrastructure, our, into our various valve, valves and so on that are in the street. So it's, yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, we definitely have an interest in having it done properly. Yeah. Okay. All right. I, I, think, I think there is interest on KMA's behalf, but again, if it's, I don't know what the timing is. You know, I always say, you know, when I think about snow removal, we adopt our budget in April, so we like to know ahead of time, you know, have some idea of what we're going to be, what, what we're going to be facing, because we don't want to, we, you know, as far as I know, we've never done a special assessment, um, so I just, I think, yeah, I think best case scenario, 
this wouldn't be considered until ne and then best case next season. And that's yeah. best, oh, yeah. best case. I, yeah. It's not for this season. Yeah, we're not. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think realistically it's probably two seasons off unless we accelerate and really want to devote a lot of time and resources to it. Okay. And that's all I had unless there's any other questions okay. on the topics I didn't cover. Questions for Okay. Thank you very much. So let's move on to 10 and Rick, uh, operations report. As you're aware, uh, PAG&E approached the district and advised that they needed to do maintenance on their system below uh, Tiger Creek within the corridor between Salt Springs Tiger Creek. Uh, the, the date for the outage or the clearance is still uh, October 30th through November 5th, and so staff is now preparing for that. Uh, we've uh, recently tested all our generators and pleased to announce that hopefully we had an issue with uh, number one, one of the number one cap, but we think we've resolved that. So um, everything should be working up and running, and um, we're going to adjust our staff schedule accordingly to make sure we have operators on site. Our biggest concern, and something that Dave Riley identified in reviewing the quote island outage, is that the generator at Salt Springs is is a very large generator, and so. He won't be able to react to our load, especially uh, as well as, as the system that is designed now, especially if we're making snow and the temperatures are, are colder. So uh, staff will be monitoring the uh, frequencies and making sure that they fall within line so, God forbid, we have an outage uh, during, this, uh, during this event. So just bring it to the board's attention that we're, we're, being, we're preparing now for this. and. Um, if there's any ancillary maintenance work that needs to be done on the underground portion of the line, uh, we may coordinate that into the same time as well. At this point, we don't expect any and are, are not planning any. So um, that's my update on that, unless there's any questions from the board. You said the generator at Salt Springs is very large. What does that have to do with us? We're going to be generating, running our own generators here, aren't we? Yeah. Our hope is actually to, to work off of PG&E's generator down there at Salt Springs okay. and not go on our generators and, and burn diesel fuel. And, and, and when we say generator, it's... For the first time. Yeah. When we say Hopefully generator, it's... can go wrong, doesn't go wrong. It's the hydro facility, It's right? the hydro facility, yeah. right, but it's, uh, its ability to fo load follow is pretty limited. And right. we're incredibly small load, so if there's a big shift in that load... No one will happen is the, is the risk. But the big advantage to us is that their electric rate is much cheaper than diesel. Cool. So it's going to be an experiment. Cool. <laughs> a controlled experiment. Trick or treat. Yeah. A oh, safely controlled, controlled experiment. Yes. Uh, next subject for operations. Um, I'm sorry, Sarah? The Six days. So just page 12. <laughs> Double that. Uh, for our collection system repair, this is something I reported on in, uh, in operations as well. Um, and, and also, Eric alluded to you know, the expenses of this. Uh, we did allocate uh, about $120,000 toward uh, collection system repair uh, for the next two years. Some of that was from the budget and, of course, a large portion from the capital improvements, capital budget. Um, but this summer was very successful. Um, we televised over 18,000 feet, cleaned and video inspected uh, our sewer lines. And a question in, uh, in the committee meeting was, what's the percentage of that within our system? And Drew came out with a number of 43.5% of our eight-mile collection system has been inspected. So answer that question. Uh, we hired Summit to repair four different sections, two on Merrill, one on Yarrow, and one on the, in the meadow between, between uh, the KCA Club, the rec center, and base camp. Uh, these are actual patches put into the system to eliminate leaks. Um, for in-house repairs, we had four of those. There were one on Upper Dangberg, one in East Meadows, and two in Yarrow. Again, where staff went into the ground, as you probably have heard through these meetings, and actually made the repairs. The biggest one being um, 
what we call was manhole 99. And this is a manhole that's in the meadow behind base camp above Derek Dornbrook's cap there is base camp, the, uh, the meadow building. And then uh, in that area, that is a, a major uh, manhole that collects from five different sources. And so one of the sources on the Meadowstone side, actually, I'll show you a picture here in just a second, um, had a significant crack in it where um, the, the penetration into the manhole itself had failed, and so we had a lot of water running into the manhole. So staff was able to get in there. Oops, that's a teaser. <laughs> Uh, staff was able to get in there and actually reseal the penetration and also put a coating on the outside of the manhole to prevent the uh, manhole from taking on any I and I. Um, and so that work's been completed. Um, so our estimate is that we're right now eliminating about 28,000, 29,000 gallons per day through the efforts of these patchings and repairs. And our rough calculation is basically um, almost $3,000 savings per month for, um, for I and I. So total cost to date for the project is around $42,000. So we're still within budget. And uh, that is what I have on collection system repairs, unless there's any questions. Any questions, Kurt? Good, good first step. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's great. It's good. Yeah, it's really good. Um, Next agenda item I have is uh, we have Scott Wood, the uh, a, his official title is Senior Risk Management Advisor from Aqua JPA, uh, come out to the district for an annual site visit to review our operations for, um, for the property and liability insurance and also to meet the new general manager. It was a very productive uh, <coughs> meeting and um, I want to highlight that uh, he mentioned that your staff should be committed on an excellent job they are doing. This reflected not only in the low losses experienced by, the, by your district, but also by the positive attitude and attention to detail that we observed. Um, again, I think uh, our relationship with Aqua JPA is, is, is very good and strong. They're very supportive of our activities, and especially with training. And... Uh, um, in, in future training and trying to schedule us uh, key and important um, training sessions to identify hazards that they're seeing throughout the, the group. The one thing he did bring up was the he asked if the district was interested in moving forward with possibly using drones to do field or line inspections and so that's what the <coughs> wonderful picture is here um, for you to consider. Um, he, he actually strongly recommended that we would either hire for that work to be done and or uh, maybe not do it. Um, they, they are, they do cover the insurance for drone work, but because of the certifications and all the rules and regulations around it, he said at this time it probably wouldn't be a great thing for the district to do. And maybe but this is delivery of a person via drone. <laughs> is that what we're implying here? Well, we're talking about a drone that our operators would use and go get caught in our power lines maybe in the out valley. So, okay. Uh, As opposed to a drone used for surveillance with a camera. Yeah. Which is considerably less expensive. True. And considerably less fun. Yeah. Well, than riding on one. Yeah. <laughs> I think you'd have to try it to know for sure. Yeah. <laughs> it's so, less fun. Uh, uh, just to clarify. Yeah. He was saying, A, just don't use drones at all. Continue to go out with your snowmobile in the middle of the winter and to inspect lines. Or B, drones are fine as long as you hire them out and it's just for surveillance. Or C, use drones to actually get there. No, well, he, what, what exactly in a nutshell, is he recommending against? He's saying, will you, we'll insure you for, for drones. No, what, what if we don't own drone? the drone? What if we don't own the drone? Uh, if you hire somebody else to do the work, you know, you're still covered. But he says all the hurdles that are involved with getting certified to fly a drone through the FAA and the other rules and regulations I know, but I'm not, well, would be okay. the issue. I, I, Michael and I first talked about this a year ago. The notion was never that we would own a drone or, or, or operate it. 
we would find a service to do it on on request. You know, a line is the power's down, a line is down, we don't know where it's down, we don't know why it's down, which happened last year. And then right. Scott so did not speak to that. Pardon? Scott did not speak to hiring a consultant. He only spoke to the district okay. performing it. I mean the idea was to have someone on on the Jackson side of the spur available with a service. And that was that was the, really the question. Yeah, and in my understanding, again, it's hiring the third party and putting the liability on them. I don't think they have a problem with it, just like asbestos abatement or anything else. Um, but if the district wanted to pursue purchasing a drone and doing it ourselves in-house, that's when he started having all Yeah, now I know yeah. some, someday you're going to want that, Rick. I can just tell. <laughs> but <laughs> so is, not is that photograph of a drone testing the tensile strength of a line? <laughs> <laughs> that is correct. Oh, okay. So I try to put some comedy relief in this presentation, right. but anyway, uh, Scott's visit was very productive, and it, again, we have a good relationship with Aqua GPIA. Uh, the next one is something that Kelly mentioned in her report, um, and as well as Eric. Our centrifuge went down, unfortunately. Uh, this is actually the machine itself and at the wastewater treatment plant. Um, what sits inside this chamber is the drum. And so staff um, has been working with Centresis on trying to uh, have a repair done as quickly as possible at the cheapest possible price. And unfortunately, it's going to be hitting a number that's close to $25,000. But this is a Achilles heel for the wastewater treatment plant. Again, it separates the heavy solids out of our affluent process. And so it's a... It's a device that we can't bypass and or modify unless we do significant work at the treatment plant, which could be considered future for, for capital improvements. But at this point, uh, we hope to get this piece of equipment repaired and back in place by November tw or October 20th. And once that is done, we'll continue to uh, monitor and try to maintain the equipment as best as possible. So what's happening in the interim? Right now, we're filling up our uh, digester, digester, which is a basin that can handle the solids. But at some point, when that's full, I mean, in years past, we've moved water from the front of the plant to the back of the plant. It's not ideal with these heavy solids, it fouls pumps, the right. hand pumps, but... Um, it's getting full. The digester is getting yeah. full. Yeah. And that translates. If we can't waste, it means our suspended solids start to increase, which could foul our membrane. So. It's a serious issue, so. Fortunately, at the flows we're at right now, this is, if it had to go down, this is the best time it could have gone down. So we're very fortunate in the way it happened, if it had to happen at all. Yeah. Um, I may not want to know the answer to the question, so how do you empty a digester? Um, With the train stamp. <laughs> <laughs> I... Ideally, you run the water through the centrifuge and separates, and um, you drain it that way. The second way is you call Summit up, and for about $1,000 a trip, they pull about six inches out of that digester, and that can be very expensive to drain it down. But if you'd like, I'd be happy to give you a tour of the wastewater plant. <laughs> it's actually good. To, it's, it's not as bad as you would think it is. Yes, it is. But no, it's, no, it's, it's not. Disgusting. And you get a free souvenir, the, the yeah, smell for the rest oh, of the day. Oh, that's not true either. Take it with. Moving right along. <laughs> to get a rendering plan sometime. Um, yeah, that concludes my report. Um, okay. Uh, questions? For me. Yeah, this is the first month that we haven't had a normal performance report. I'm just wondering if we're going to have that. Um, you know, kilowatt hours used, not you know lost water, wastewater, etc. That was provided to the committee, right, Jeff? Oh, oh but it wasn't uh, in the board. Yeah. Yeah, we have, yeah. Brandy, you normally what? do that? Is there a... Um, it, it, it was not, uh, it wasn't on the agenda for this month or last month. Um, I did provide it to the, uh, the committee. Yeah, so my, my just re request is, I mean, the, it's a, it doesn't yeah. necessarily have to be covered. It would be nice to have it in the packet because it is what we do. It's the result of what we do, right? Yeah. What we sold and so on. We get the financial picture, but it would be nice to have the quantitative picture too. 
you, you that's something you can just distribute to the board without agenda, agenda in it, if that helps. Yeah, yeah, yeah just having it in the package. Yeah, it should be a standard part of the agenda. Okay. Or at least I'm used to I'd like well, to we're see used that to having it that way. Yeah. Um, whether it's actually discussed is up to you guys, but I mean, just having it would be having the data in the package. Right. Right. I think it should be yeah. part of the agenda too. Yeah, it doesn't take long for. It's highly related to the financials. It's also the way. I mean, first doing it, as Brandy will, will remember and Rick will remember. I mean, I think that's how we started to get a handle on where to focus attention. Mm -hmm. On improvements. We'll include it happily. Okay, anything else for operations? <coughs> right, thank you, Rick. Uh, standing committee reports, uh, finance. Standing, anything? Oh, on the finance, the only thing that um, we had talked about was an update on the FEMA request, and we've made it. We're waiting. I think that's the only other. We deferred on the other two items connection fee. Updates and uh, fire speed updates. Uh, okay, uh, planning. Um, Randy gave us an update on the Western Area Power Association and the application, <coughs> and just let us know that you're following that and letting us know when we need to make decisions. But anything that would happen, happen. Hopefully, something will happen that's positive. But in the end, we don't get anything from WAPA until 2025. So it's a long, long ways away. Um, housing ordinance and a move fee. Um, so Eric, Doug, and either Gary or Nate will be getting together. Um, you know, I think these well getting together and, and, and going over <coughs> draft and maybe probably redrafting the proposed ordinance that would would replace what's in place now. Including our connection fee, possibly or a portion of the connection fees. Correct. But the counties have given the resort a, a year or the developer a year more to um, to review that mitigation of, of the specific plan. So they've extended it to the, for a year. Correct. Um, and then uh, uh, then we'll serve update. Um, Brandy is working with Nate, I guess on. Um, making sure that we have an up-to-date picture of what we've committed and what our capacities are. And you'll be re revising the capacity study, as I recall. Yeah. That's it. Okay. Operations? Uh, I've got, we've talked about everything except uh, what Eric just mentioned, and that I've got it on the computer. If you want to oh, that. okay. Oh, that's okay. Yes. You just yeah. wish more of that. You just want well, to have it in the pack. Okay. Like the one. numbers are pretty good. I start okay. feeling like lost. Yeah. We'll go in the pack and take a look. <laughs> okay. No, no, no. Peter, we also had the um, Rick, uh, you're delaying the purchase of those self containing breathing devices. Right. Right. Well, we, we have them for a good cause. So. Okay. Is there the possibility of, of getting it paid through a grant? So and we feel that we're. Yeah. The devices now are adequate to get us through this winter and save some money, potentially. Uh, one more thing on planning, yeah. that is the fire services master plan. Yes. I think we'll have a draft in November. We will have a draft mm -hmm. to the committee in to November. The committee, and, hopefully that will be the final draft. and that will be, I, I believe, we that will be our only agendized item for November. Uh, yeah. uh, okay. Um, on personnel, I think the only item we mentioned that I think I'd like to mention is we asked to think about um, training for next year, particularly focused on uh, management training, team building, and communications uh, to help help with the transition. Um, and then on IT, we we spent a fair amount of time on the iPad project. We approved a replacement for the in-house server for three thousand dollars. That was that was uh, badly needed, and. <coughs> Something that came out that really falls into that, that's um, Thursday, I guess it was Thursday afternoon, um, all possible communication shut down simultaneously. So the, the hardwired phones, the cell service, and the Internet. And so there was no way to communicate in or out. And I had no idea that there was such a single point of failure. And so somewhere along the line, I'd like to figure out 
the probability of that happening again and what what addition is there a communication source that we want to have as a backup that's we not we do have so we have a satellite and we also have the radios and we we're and maybe Rick can speak to this but we were able to communicate with um, uh, the dispatchers and so we were able to communicate that we were down so we always had the radio with all the signals so emergency services were not impacted everything else was impacted significantly so okay our pager system did go down as well yeah which is also linked so it was we were all struggling for a little bit uh, it, it was a bit of a surprise okay uh, so I think that's it for standing committees move on to yes I just want, I just want to make a comment um, regarding the um, something it was a light bulb that went on for me because I participated in the personnel committee and we always see the we we're always reviewing the org chart and I guess for forever I've always thought that whatever somebody's title was meant that they were certified in whatever work that they were um, doing. So in other words, if I'm an operator in the wastewater treatment plant, that I've got the certifications to back up that title. And I learned that that's not necessarily the case. I don't know what the implications are of that, but I just, it was like, huh. Um, so, I just, just mention it. Okay. Eric, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, again, there's still some com conflation of two issues. One, the title, and two, the certifications. What Nancy said is partially correct, but let me see if I can break it into components. Someone's titled a wastewater operator one. That doesn't mean they're certified as a wastewater operator one. Under the way the employee description is written, the job description is written, they could be an OIT which means they're not a wastewater grade one, they're an OIT. It's, so how the district has written their job descriptions historically and what certifications are required for the various job descriptions don't necessarily mean the same thing, although they may use similar words. And so there's some conflation of two issues there. Um, rest assured we have staff that is legally allowed to operate all of our systems. And our OIT is a six-month process, but they're allowed to operate under someone else's wastewater license. Um, so, and as we talked about, I think Bob and I talked about, I'll be re-getting, re-getting? That's the horrible English. <laughs> Dear Lord, that's horrible. I will be renewing my, since 2000 expired, wastewater, water treatment, and water distribution licensure, just so we have <coughs> an extra layer of protection in there. Although I don't want to do that again, I really don't mind it. Yeah. Even wastewater, Nancy, is not that bad. So we could solve the problem by changing our internal titles because that's where it, it creates the perception of it. I think the job descriptions are clear as to what's required. Yeah. Okay. Uh, good. Um, then let's move on to general discussion, opportunity to ask questions, clarifications. Um, I have just one item I want to mention um, just because of what, what Eric said. So I am... I'm interested in expanding our sales of electricity and in the new markets. And I, I think there's two opportunities. One is electric vehicle charging, which I think is fairly far off uh, at, at, at this point. But I am. Uh, yeah. I'm glad you brought that up. Sorry, because yeah. it wasn't on our agenda. But Doug, at our planning committee meeting, brought up that Tesla has a, has expressed interest in putting more chargers here and specifically out on Highway 88. And so Doug said the logical place for them, of course, is right next to the gas, you know, the gas pump. Right. Um, and so Tesla is doing a feasibility study for that. And I okay. assume that they're somehow in, in contact with, with our staff to see what it takes to get the right power over there and so on. Um, not, as of yet. not as of yet, but it, it will be. I guess it will ha be. Yeah. And I thought it was interesting that Doug's opinion is that the Chargers don't need any protection from from snow. I unlike the uh, rest of us. Unlike the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know, but I, you know, I just thought this was a very interesting thing. And w what Doug brought up, and this is something for us to somehow consider, is is how is the electricity paid for? In other words, ideally, the customer pays for it. Right. Um, but what's the mechanism for, for that? And I think that's the stumbling block that Doug sees. 
Okay. I think Doug's comment on that, and this goes back to your not wanting to subsidize people. Yeah. I think we concur with that. And Doug's comment was, well, how about a, you know, a credit card and they pay per kilowatt hour that, you know, that they right. use. And so there, there is an opportunity there to recoup the cost and not subsidize on the back of our customers, the, right. the charging stations. Um, but I think what we talked about with Doug and, and what Eric's alluding to, as this becomes as this becomes more of a thing, as it actually gets some more substance to it and cohesiveness and actually is a real thing, we'll be bringing it back to committee um, as soon as we have something to report and discuss. So that will definitely right. be coming back to committee first and then ultimately to the board for consideration of yeah. how they want to proceed. So I'm just saying over time we want to compete with gasoline and sell electricity, and that may require a different rate structure than what we currently have. And, but I see it as an opportunity but not a form of a subsidy, uh, you know, or not. So that's one item. The other opportunity would be to get uh, commercial buildings to switch to heat pu electric heat pumps instead of propane and to structure that so there's a benefit to the building owner. And we economically, if we sold energy in the form of electricity, I think we're better off than if we sold it in the form of propane. It, it makes very little sense to retrofit an existing home economically, but it might make sense on commercial buildings. So in that regards, the, uh, there's a center at UC Davis for energy efficiency and energy things. I've talked with the management there. I'm on one of their advisory boards, and I might possibly be able to identify a student at, for, for free that might start to look into feasibility. They also have come up with some new types of heat pumps. Um, that, uh, you know, for ground storage heat pumps that can just navigate through the ground and make their loops and just navigate through, find a rock, skip it, and the rest of that. So there may be some very cost-effective ways to build uh, the ground loops so you get your, you know, your, your temperature differential there. And I, I do, so, but none of this would be in the, all of this would be in the name of lowering rates, not finding subsidies. So just to make it clear. Well, in the name of possibly increasing rates, um, <laughs> one thing I'd like just I'd like to understand a little bit better as we move forward with with um, renewing our contract with with Shell Energy or going to some other entity um, is is it when is it beneficial to increase the percentage of our power that comes from renewable sources? or at least non-fossil fuel sources? Because uh, I think we've got some control over the mix, right? I mean, yeah, so yeah, yeah, absolutely. One of the things we're doing is next, which we talked about um, this month and, and next month, we're putting out a request for a proposal because um, our contract with Shell expires in December. Mm -hmm. So renewable sources will have an opportunity. We've already had an inquiry from one um, that I think is 100%, I think they were. So we've had inquiries um, to that end. So we'll ultimately get the proposals back and, and bring those back before the committee. And committee but it would really be cool to transfer from propane to electric on, on matters like the heat pump and be able to say that it's 100% yeah. non-fossil fuel or 100% renewable. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, any other general discussion items? Okay, then uh, we will move into closed session now to... Uh, discuss uh, significant exposure litigation involving two potential cases. Thank you all. Hey, Cheryl. So maybe I'll give you a call or something. Oh, you don't okay. want to.